let you ask a question, but I think um, we have had a um, wide range of views on it. The next item of business is stage three proceedings on the Procurement Reform Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the bills amended at stage two. That is SP Bill 3080. The marshal list, that is SP Bill 38 AML. The groupings, that is SP Bill 30 AG. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after that group is called. Members should now refer to the marshal list of amendments. And I call Group 1, um, which is on the Scottish uh, Living Beach. I call Amendment Number 11 in the name of James Kelly, grouped with Amendments Number 14, 6, 7, 9 and 10. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to move Amendments 11 and 14 uh, in my, my name. There is no doubt that the living wage is an idea whose time has come. And the Labour Amendment to pay £7.65 across all public contracts would make a massive difference to the 400,000 people who are not on the living wage currently, many thousands of whom would be covered by these public contracts. That would give a rise of, to many of £2,600 a year. 64% uh, of these uh, people are women. So this is an opportunity not only to help women, but an opportunity to tackle low pay in public contracts. This is a chance to give cleaners and care home staff from Cambus Lang to Carnoustie a fair deal. The living wage is delivered in London, and yet here in Scotland uh, we're dragging our heels on this bill. Why is it that Boris Johnson can be so bold, yet Nicola Sturgeon is so timid? The SNP, in terms of the SNP amendments, clearly Nicola Sturgeon's amendments reflect the fact that they have moved their position from stage one when there was little mention of the living wage in the bill. But the effect of this is simply uh, a nod in the direction. As the government themselves acknowledge, it is not mandatory. The absolute test on this would be if the cleaners who work on Scottish Government contracts in Scottish Government pr prisons who are currently not on the living wage. I challenge the Deputy First Minister if the effect of these amendments would make any difference, and it's my view that they will not. The legal position, as outlined by David Martin in an answer to David Martin in the European Parliament, is clear. Living wage conditions may be included in public performance contract clauses and public performance clauses of, the pub, of a public procurement contract. Do the SNP MSPs want to make a positive change or have they come here simply to pose in the Parliament's coffee bars? The point of legislation, the point of legislation is to make a difference. Let's not be a pretendy wee Parliament. Let's stand up and be counted. Vote for the living wage and give a pay boost to thousands of workers on low pay. I call Deputy First Minister to speak to Amendment 6 and other amendments in the group. Uh, Presiding officer, I'm pleased to recommend my amendments 6, 7, 9 and 10. These amendments will considerably strengthen the bill in relation to the payment of the living wage and they will do so in a way that is both meaningful and legal. Uh, this bill will impact on £10 billion worth of spending each year. That means that it does matter that we do everything we can in this bill to ensure that that money is spent in a way that contributes to economic prosperity, equality and social justice. But it also means that if we get it wrong and end up with court challenges, it will be very costly indeed for Scotland's taxpayers. Uh, as a government, uh, yes. Mark, I'm just... I, I admired the way in which she 
went forward with minimum pricing of alcohol and it's ended up in court, as was almost certain to happen, by a challenge. Why was she prepared to be bold on that issue, but not on this issue, where in fact there is less certainty of a challenge than there was on that one? Secretary. I, I do think the issues are different. I mean, I regret the legal challenge over minimum pricing, but it is about a policy we are seeking to bring in. This is about public contracts that our public bodies will be awarding here and now. Surely the suggestion is not that we put our public bodies in a position where they face the risk of legal challenge. Uh, I want to ensure that we abide by the law uh, and that we don't put our public bodies at that risk of being taken to court. Uh, we don't disagree, and I've said this before, we don't disagree with the objective of making payment of the living wage a mandatory requirement of public contracts. I think it is worth reiterating our record on this issue. We are the first Scottish Government, let me say that again to Labour, the first Scottish Government to adopt the living wage for all of our employers uh, and we encourage all other employers, public, private, third sector to pay their staff the living wage. We're providing funding to the Poverty Alliance to promote living wage accreditation and increase the number of employers paying the living wage in Scotland. I'll take a brief yes. intervention. Can the, can the Deputy First Minister give an unequivocal assurance that her amendments will ensure that, Scottish, that cleaners working in Scottish Government prisons who are not currently paid the living wage will be paid the living wage? I'll Can't come on if James Kelly wants to bear with me to explain exactly what our amendments will allow us to do. Uh, but the point I'm making here is there can be no doubt about this government's commitment to the principles of the living wage campaign. Uh, what we are debating today is how we use this bill to further promote the living wage, not if we use it. Now, in light of the ongoing debate, members are aware that the First Minister wrote to the European Commission uh, seeking further clarification of the legal position. Uh, the reply which we received uh, towards the end of last week states, and I'm going to quote from it, any such requirements must comply with the posting of workers directive and the related case law of the Court of Justice of the EU if they are applicable to workers sent from another member state. A contractual condition to pay a living wage set at a higher rate than the general minimum wage is unlikely to meet the requirement not to go beyond the mandatory protection provided for by the directive. So again, we have advice from the Commission and from the Commissioner responsible for procurement uh, that makes the position on this clear. Now, we're disappointed that this is the case. We will continue to press for further change at EU level. And if such change is forthcoming uh, and it does become possible to make the living wage a mandatory condition of public contracts, then we will take steps to reflect that position in the approach we take here in Scotland. But we have never been prepared to simply wring our hands and say, because EU law prevents us making the living wage a mandatory condition, then we are going to do nothing. Uh, we have considered carefully what we can do within the law. And that's why the bill provides that ministers can issue statutory guidance on how workforce matters should be taken into account in procurement decisions. Amendments 9 and 10 make clear that this can specifically deal with the living wage. Uh, that guidance will mean that companies wishing to bid, especially for service contracts where low pay has traditionally been an issue, will have their approach to managing, rewarding and engaging with their workforce evaluated. And that will include, where it's relevant to the contract, the willingness and the ability of bidders to pay the living wage. Uh, I met just last week with the STUC, the Poverty Alliance and Unison to give them a commitment that we will develop the guidance with them uh, in partnership to ensure that it is robust, not at the moment, to ensure that it is robust and that its implementation is carefully uh, monitored. In addition to the amendments that will ensure that guidance will deal specifically uh, with remuneration, amendments six and seven will require all contracting authorities to set out their policy on the living wage as part of their procurement strategies. Now, presiding officer, taken together, that package of measures sends a very powerful message to businesses wanting to sell to Scotland's public sector. It says that they will be expected to demonstrate their willingness and ability to pay the living wage and that they will need to be able to demonstrate that they're not winning contracts by undercutting competitors on the basis of a poorly paid workforce. And it's interesting that James Kelly mentions London. I find it particularly interesting that James Kelly doesn't mention Wales, the part of the UK where Labour is actually in government. Uh, because what we are doing today 
goes significantly further than the Labour administration in Wales has managed to do. This is what the Labour government in Wales says, and I am quoting, there is no ministerial policy or directive to adopt the living wage into Welsh government contracts. That's the position that stands in stark contrast to the rhetoric of James Kelly and what Labour actually do when they are in a position to act. I am proud that this government will continue to promote the living wage, will do everything we can within this bill and beyond to ensure that we are furthering the living wage, and I would urge all members to welcome that position. So while we cannot support, and I'm just about to finish, while we cannot support amendments 11 and 14, I would hope that members will recognise that we are tackling this issue in the strongest way possible and we will continue to do so. So I would ask in conclusion uh, that amendments 11 and 14 are rejected but I would ask the Chamber to back my amendments which will go further than any previous government in this Chamber has done to ensure that the living wage is central to all that we do with public money. I now call Ali Johnson, followed by Patrick Harvey, and then Tavis Scott, if you could all be fairly brief. OK. Uh, I will try to be, uh, Presiding Officer. I came here today to discuss a bill about procurement, a bill which will leave public procurement in a position where it is easy to understand and accessible uh, to all those who wish to bid for public contracts. It's important for our private sector. It's important for our third sector. Uh, it's important that we all understand how that works. The problem I have with many of the amendments which will be discussed today is that they seek to use this bill as a proxy to introduce valid ideas from the, across the political spectrum uh, which uh, can be put into this uh, bill as, an, as amendments but which would result in the bill not being the effective instrument which it would otherwise be. If we look specifically at the proposal in amendment, uh, amendment 11, uh, and 14. We find that James Kelly would wish to use this bill as a way of introducing the living wage uh, across Scotland in public contracts. Yet, what we fail to do is understand that before we can do that, we need to know how it will be financed. Is, there are, for example, 636 care homes across Scotland with 40,000 part or full-time staff. I do wish to see them paid uh, appropriately for what they, uh, they do, and it's important that we all have that as an objective in the longer term. But this amendment could result in the average care home costs rising to as much as £1,000 per week per person, and that would result in a collapse in our care home sector that would make Southern Cross look like small beer by comparison. So I believe it's inappropriate to exploit this bill for that, this purpose. And while I fully commend the Labour Party for their uh, long-held objective to achieve uh, the living wage in Scotland, it is at the same time an inappropriate place to try and bring in this amendment. And it makes it necessary for uh, we in this corner to oppose the amendment as it stands. Thank you very much. Tavi Scott to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I recognise the Government have made progress in this matter, but we do support James Kelly's amendments. And I listened carefully to the remarks that the Deputy First Minister made today on the legal point. Now, if I, uh, if I wrote down her words uh, accurately from the letter she quoted from the European Union, uh, the European Commission rather, it is that the, the, it, it, is, it is unlikely, I think she used the word unlikely, a direct quote from uh, that letter. Now, that strikes me as still some room uh, for manipulation. It's not a no, it's not an uh, unequivocal statement, and therefore uh, it is open to the government, I would hope, to press that matter. I'm sure they're considering pressing it with the European Commission, but it is open to the government to press uh, that particular point so as to see as to whether, even with a limited chance of success, that uh, success, which I'm sure the Deputy First Minister wishes to, to achieve, uh, is uh, possible. And given the, uh, the equivocal answer from the European Commission, I hope the government might take that matter forward in that kind of way. Many thanks. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. I'm going to take it as a, a, a non-debatable point that most people in this chamber want the living wage to be paid throughout our economy, particularly in the public sector, and believe that poverty pay is a disgrace on our society. Certainly, I'm convinced that both the Deputy First Minister and James Kelly are of one mind on the objective. I will be voting for James Kelly's amendment and if that falls for the Deputy First Minister's amendments in this group. I would say to, to James Kelly, though, uh, respectfully, that 
to present this amendment by baiting the other side is perhaps not the best way to make the case. Uh, I think he, he knows the reaction he was provoking in the way that he put forward his arguments, and it's probably not the best way to make the case. I understand the frustration. I understand the frustration that he feels. I've felt it as well when ministers in the current administration or the previous administration say we can't do this because EU law prevents us. He'll understand the frustration of my colleagues in Edinburgh City Council when they put forward the same thing and Labour and the SNP join forces to say no, using more or less the same arguments. But I, I take the view that Malcolm Chisholm expressed uh, in his intervention, that sometimes it is necessary for governments to be willing to test the boundaries of what's allowable. And I think that's a, a more articulate means of making the case uh, with colleagues in Europe than simply advocating for an issue, being willing to go in there and fight for it. They were able to do that on minimum pricing, much to their credit, and the Deputy First Minister had a great deal to do with pushing that case. Uh, I wish that the same attitude was being taken on procurement, being willing actually to test the limits of what is permissible, and on that basis, uh, I'll be voting for the amendments. Many thanks. I now turn to James Kelly to wind up and indicate, please, if you intend to press or withdraw. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I do intend to press the amendments. Uh, I was interested to hear the Deputy First Minister's speech, and I have no indication that the amendments that are being proposed will close the low-pay loophole that exists, where workers currently not being paid the living wage and working on contracts on behalf of the Scottish Government uh, this, this change you know, will not compel the living wage to be paid. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of the debate has centred around uh, legal argument. Uh, Tavi Scott is correct to quote from the, 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 the letter uh, the word unlikely. You know, so that, that letter wasn't exactly clear. I think the Deputy First Minister's intention in, in bringing that forward mm -hmm. uh, was to try and give uh, a bit of cover, you know, it's almost like an excuse note. Uh, please, please excuse Nicola Sturgeon today. She's not able to take the living wage forward in Parliament. This is not, uh, it's not really an issue, a legal issue. It's about political will. I'm quite sure, I'm quite sure that there are, there are MS, SNP MSPs on those benches uh, who wish that the government would be a bit more bold on, these issue, on this issue. But it seems that the, the more cautious voices, perhaps the Fergus Ewings and the Alex Salmons, uh, have unfortunately won the day. I give way to Maureen. Maureen Watt. I thank the member for taking an intervention. Would he accept that we wouldn't even have to be talking about the living wage if successive governments in Westminster had set the minimum wage at a decent rate and uprated it? <laughs> James Kelly, order please. The issue, Answer the issue the point. that the order, order, order. The, the issue for the SNP government and SNP MSPs is the bill that's before us today to deliver seven pounds sixty-five across all public contracts, and that's the opportunity. That's the challenge. Let's see how you vote uh, when the division comes in a short time. The, 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 the calls for the living wage are not only been made by the STUC, by the SCVO, but it's also been backed by businesses like KPMG and Nationwide. And we shouldn't want to, to lag behind. This is a real opportunity. We've all seen the photographs of SNP MSPs uh, pledging support for payment of the minimum wage. This is the chance to put your money where your mouth is. This is not a photo opportunity. It's a chance to make it a reality. Vote for a mandatory living wage today. Thank you. As James Kelly has indicated that he is pressing, the question then is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be a division, as this is the first division uh, of the afternoon. The Parliament is suspended for five minutes.
order, we will now proceed <coughs> with the division on Amendment 11. <clears throat> and this is a 30-second division. Members should please cast their votes now. Order. The result of the vote on amendment number 11 is yes, 44, no, 74. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. That brings us to group two. Order. That brings us to group two, sustainable procurement duty. Order. Order. Group two, sustainable procurement duty, and I call amendment 30 in the name of Patrick Harvey, Group with amendments 15, eh, sorry, 16, 32 and 39. Patrick Harvey to move amendment 30 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Clearly the whole chamber is seized with excitement about the sustainable procurement duty. I'm sure that's, yes. I'm sure that's really what it is, Deputy Presiding Officer. The, uh, the amendments in this group uh, fall into to two areas from myself. The first, amendment 30, is about the relationship, the balance between the general duty and the sustainable procurement duty. And I suppose it's worth recalling that once upon a time, before this bill was introduced, people referred to it as the sustainable procurement bill. And then it became the procurement bill and the procurement reform bill. And now the sustainable procurement duty is one small section within it. It's good that it's there. I'm very pleased that it's there. But as it's phrased at the moment, we have this general duty, which includes uh, the uh, requirement to treat relevant economic operators equally and without discrimination, in other words, acting in the interests of a free market uh, in procurement. And it says nothing in the sustainable procurement duty uh, should conflict with that subsection. I'm seeking in Amendment 30 to say that rather nothing in subsection 1, nothing in the general duty, should be taken to prohibit uh, a contracting authority from considering any matter or acting in any way to fulfil the sustainable procurement duty. That sustainable procurement, in other words, takes precedence, uh, and that, uh, the, the wider sustainable, uh, that the wider general duty on procurement should exist within that. Now, at, uh, at stage one, the committee called for the Scottish Government to provide further information on how contracting authorities are supposed to balance the duties uh, in, uh, in practice. And the uh, Deputy First Minister, in the stage one debate, uh, said that she was happy to consider that uh, in more detail and come back to the issue at stage two. That didn't happen. There haven't been amendments uh, to uh, address the, the question of balance from the government. Uh, and I hope that uh, this uh, will be taken as an opportunity from the, the Deputy First Minister to address the question. Uh, on uh, Amendment 32, uh, I'm seeking to uh, add an additional requirement. And, uh, this relates to um, the uh, duties under the Climate Change Scotland Act and the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights. Now, the, uh, the Scottish Government has uh, an action plan on human rights. Uh, in many ways, it's a very good document. It says that the Scottish and UK Government, Scottish businesses and the Human Rights Commission will pursue the development of an action plan to implement the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights by Scotland and raise awareness among Scottish companies of their human rights responsibilities. Well, what better way to give effect to the commitment in that action plan than by including this provision in the, uh, the guidance that the ministers are expected to publish on uh, procurement? This would uh, address uh, the, the global sustainability issues uh, which go beyond the, the geographically limited uh, aspects of sustainability that already exist within the bill, the climate change Scotland duties so that procurement has a clear link into that, that legislation and the UN guiding principles for business and human rights. And it's, uh, it comes with support from Amnesty International, which I know many members uh, are personally supportive of. Uh, Amnesty is calling uh, 
uh, for the support of Amendment 32. It says excluding this amendment would be a missed opportunity for the Scottish Government's human rights agenda. So I, uh, I'm, I'm open and, and, uh, and interested in hearing the arguments on the other amendments in this group. I'm sympathetic to them, but I'll, I'll let the proposers speak to those. For the moment, I move Amendment 30. Many thanks. I now call Jackie Bailey to speak to Amendment 16 and the other amendments in the group, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I believe that re reducing inequality is a shared ambition across this chamber. My amendment therefore seeks to ensure that this is at the very heart of the sustainable procurement duty. The duty is framed in general terms, and I understand from a debate with the Cabinet Secretary at Stage 2 that she promises there will be further definition of the duty in guidance. And I couldn't help but recall, presiding officer, um, when we were shaping legislation in the early days of the parliament as a minister, that even then civil servants always advised ministers to avoid putting something on the face of the bill and offer it up in guidance. It would appear that despite the passage of time, not a lot has changed. But let me say to the chamber, we should put on the face of any legislation what matters to us. Of course, we should put the detail in guidance, but I had always understood that a key principle of this Scottish Government was about tackling inequality. Indeed, it was a mere week ago that the Scottish Government spoke about the persistent inequality that exists in our society. The rhetoric was rightly robust, but we need to do more than simply shout. We need and must take action. So by passing this amendment, this Parliament says that tackling inequality matters. It is one small step, but it is a central step to making progress. So if we share an ambition for a more equal Scotland, and I believe we do, then we should be using our considerable public spending to deliver just that, as well as the right framework in which contracts are awarded. You know, having a clear, sharp focus on tackling inequality should be very much part of everything we do. It can drive the public sector in considering how they can secure important gains for their local communities in the contracts they award. And these are substantial sums of public money. Here is an opportunity, a practical opportunity, for the Scottish Government to demonstrate that it matches its rhetoric with action by backing Amendment 16, and I so move. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I understand that Sarah Boyack is unable to attend the chamber today and that Claudia Beamish will be moving Amendment 39. And I therefore invite Claudia Beamish to speak to Amendment 39 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to speak to Amendment 39, which is intended to place a duty on the contracting authority when publicising the award of a contract to include a statement that sets out how the contract will help achieve the contracting authority's sustainable procurement duty. The sustainable procurement duty, as we've already heard in this group, is an important provision in this bill, and it is essential that the requirements are met. This amendment will ensure that the duties, such as facilitating the involvement of SMEs and the improvement of economic, social and environmental well-being, are well publicised, clarifying the commitment of public bodies to promote positive social outcomes. SCVO have repeatedly stressed the need to put sustainability issues centre stage, and a clear statement of intent on public contracts on the public contracts website would ensure that this is achieved. I am aware that at stage two proceedings, the Deputy First Minister voiced her concerns that this amendment would place an undue burden on public bodies. However, my Scottish Labour colleagues and I still believe that an explicit duty to publicise the measures taken to fulfil the, sust the sustainable procurement duty would reinforce this commitment and prevent it from being sidestepped, and I hope this amendment is adopted in the Bill today. I would also like to speak in support of Jackie Bailey's amendments and believe it is imperative that we do see equalities on the face of this Bill, and I hope that the whole Parliament will also agree with that. Thank you. Many thanks. Deputy First Minister. The sustainable procurement duty is, is not a small part of the bill, as Patrick Harvey seemed suge to suggest. It is a vitally important element of the bill. And indeed, I would argue that it is the linchpin of this bill. It requires public bodies to think very carefully about how the procurement process can make real improvements 
to their area and enable SMEs, supported businesses and the third sector to access contract opportunities. However, like every other section of the Bill, we have to ensure that it's consistent with EU law, that it is reasonably simple to apply and that it doesn't impose disproportionate burdens on contracting authorities. Um, can I just uh, speak to the amendments in turn, uh, starting with Amendment 30? As I said at Stage 2, I absolutely understand and appreciate Patrick Harvey's motivation in putting forward this amendment. However, my objection to Amendment 30 is pretty fundamental. Uh, the general and sustainable procurement duties are framed with a view to helping public bodies understand how the duty should be interpreted and applied within the overarching framework of EU law. Section 8, subsection 3 of the Bill makes it clear for authorities that any action they take under the duty must be compatible with these EU law duties. The effect that Amendment 30 would have would be to create a situation where the Bill would seek to impose requirements on public bodies to do things even if those things are not compatible with European law. Now, clearly, that's not acceptable, and it's not a position that we can place public bodies in. Yes. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. This argument seems to suggest that there are things necessary to do in order to achieve sustainable procurement, which, in fact, are prohibited by the general duty. What are those things? No, the, the, what, First Minister. what the Bill says is that at all times in implementing the duties that are imposed on the Bill, either the general duty or the specific duties, they must operate within the confines of European law. Now, you know, that I, I would have thought would be a position that all members would appreciate the importance of. Now, Patrick Harvey made uh, what I thought was a a valid and legitimate uh, contribution earlier about the guidance that we uh, should give to contracting authorities to help them uh, balance the different aspects of the sustainable procurement duty. Uh, he'll be aware that Section 90, I think it is, of the Bill uh, provides for guidance. I would be very happy to engage further with Patrick Harvey in the process of developing that guidance about how we do that in a way that encourages uh, contracting authorities to make the best and the maximum use of the sustainable procurement duty. But we cannot put public authorities into a position where we are requiring them to do things regardless of their compliance with EU law. And that, I think, is a, a pretty simple point. Um, if I can turn to Amendment 16, uh, which relates to considerations of well-being in the sustainable procurement duty, and it seeks to define well-being as including the reduction of inequality, something I think we can all um, agree with as an objective. Uh, reducing inequality is clearly part of the authority's general duty in promoting the well-being of its area. Uh, and while I think there is an argument for the duty itself to be framed in general terms, uh, I am, as I said at stage two, sympathetic to the intent behind this amendment and on further reflection and at risk of completely taking the feet from Jackie Bailey, I can confirm that I will support uh, this particular amendment, demonstrating uh, that her cynicism about ministers is, as usual, completely misplaced. <laughs> If I can turn to Amendment 32, the purpose of which is to place a duty on Scottish ministers when preparing guidance uh, on the duty to consider the likely effects on global sustainability, the compliance uh, by authorities with their duties under the Climate Change Act 2009 and the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights. Again, I want to emphasise here the need for the Bill to be pragmatic and reasonably simple to comply with. The Bill already provides a mechanism for dealing with companies that don't meet appropriate standards, contracting authorities who already have to comply with a range of requirements derived from EU law and equal treatment and national equality legislation, in addition, of course, to being subject to obligations under the Human Rights Act. The public sector, as everybody is aware, procures a very diverse range of goods, services and works, and it's important that the statutory guidance that will support the duty is flexible, adaptable and isn't seen to be disproportionate. So I don't support Patrick Harvey's amendment, but I will reaffirm and reissue indeed the invitation I extended to him at stage two to discuss how we use uh, and indeed to invite him to be involved in the drafting of the statutory guidance that will underpin uh, the duty to encapsulate the points he's seeking to make about the wider implications of procurement exercises. And I can give an assurance, and I know this is an assurance that will be important to organisations like Amnesty International that was quoted by Patrick Harvey, that we do see the development of guidance uh, as an important opportunity to uh, both identify and to explain how the UN guiding principles are best reflected in our procurement processes. And I hope Patrick Harvey will take up uh, that offer to be involved in the next stage of this process. Finally, Presiding Officer, Amendment 39 uh, from Sarah Boyack 
Again, I will stress that keeping the burden on public bodies to a minimum is important. Uh, Section 14 of the Bill will require a contracting authority to prepare and publish an annual report. That annual report will include a summary of regulated procurements and a review of whether those procurements complied with the authority's procurement strategy. I do not therefore think it is necessary or proportionate to require contracting authorities to state in every single contract award notice how the contract will contribute to the achievement of improving the economic, social and environmental well-being of the area. Uh, I think that would add an unnecessary and disproportionate burden of bureaucracy. Um, so, in conclusion, I would ask that Patrick Carvey withdraw Amendment 30, uh, not move Amendment 32, uh, that uh, Claudia Beamish, on behalf of uh, Sarah Boyack, does not move Amendment 39 and reiterate uh, my willingness to support Amendment 16 in the name of Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much. Can I invite Patrick Harvey to wind up and indicate an intention? Sorry. Uh, sorry, and indicate an intention to press or withdraw. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The, the Deputy First Minister described the sustainable procurement duty as the linchpin of the legislation. I can't read the bill any other way than to suggest that it's Section 8, the general duties, which are the linchpin, that they are the critical, the vital element which contracting authorities will be primarily focused on and the secondary focus will be on the sustainable procurement duty. So I would, uh, I would disagree uh, that uh, the Deputy First Minister's description of the bill is accurate as the, as the bill is currently drafted. Uh, I think that, um, notwithstanding uh, the smile on Jackie Bailey's face as, as she heard that her amendment would be selected, I think she made a, a, a decent point that uh, although ministers and civil servants may often take the instinctive position that uh, less is more on the face of a bill and let's leave everything to guidance. Parliament, I think, does need to steer the development of guidance. And even passing amendments to legislation which indicate to ministers the issues they ought to address when it comes to drafting the guidance gives Parliament the ability to, to give that steer. And on, on issues as, uh, as, as critical ethical issues as inequality, sustainability, climate change and human rights, I think Parliament should do so. Um, the Deputy First Minister also said, uh, particularly in relation to Amendment 32, that uh, the bill needs to be simple to comply with. Uh, Amendment 32 does not add huge complexity for contracting authorities for uh, people responsible for procurement processes. It adds one relatively simple task for ministers to undertake, not for anyone else. And if the government is serious about addressing uh, these ethical uh, issues uh, in the guidance, then having the requirement to do so in the legislation uh, seems a relatively simple uh, and trivial task for Parliament to set them. Uh, this is about ministers' compliance with the legislation, not anything else. I'm grateful for the, uh, the invitation to engage further. Uh, however, from stage one and two, there's been continual uh, indications that there would be attempts to address this during the passage of the bill, and that, I'm afraid, it hasn't happened. So I'll be uh, pressing Amendment uh, 30 to the vote uh, and 32 when it comes to that time as well. Deputy Presiding Officer. Many thanks. The question then is that Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. This will be <coughs> a one minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 30 is yes 39, 
No 80. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. That brings us to Group 3, Sustainable Procurement Duty and Strategy Specific Issues. And I call Amendment 15 in the name of Jackie Bailey, which is grouped with Amendments 31, 19 and 37. And I ask Jackie Bailey to move Amendment 15, please, and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you very much, President. Presiding officer, and I rise to speak to Amendment 15 and all others in the group. There was a suggestion made um, from a sedentary position that I quit whilst I was ahead, but always the eternal optimist. Whilst I'm grateful for the support for Amendment 16 from the Cabinet Secretary, I live in hope that she will continue her same consensual manner with my remaining amendments. Um, amendment 15 seeks to promote compliance with the public sector equality duty, and Amendment 19 relates to public bodies setting out how they will promote compliance. It is perhaps worth explaining that the public sector equality duty um, actually requires. It is set out in section 149 of the Equality Act 2010, which requires that listed public authorities must have due regard when exercising their functions to things such as the need to eliminate discrimination, harassment and victimisation, and to advance equality of opportunity and to foster good relations. The phrase due regard means that when public bodies make decisions, they must consciously consider the needs expressed in the duty. However, the amount of regard they need to give depends very much on the nature of that decision. So, for example, a procurement decision on a service for older people would require far more consideration, rightly so, than a procured dis procurement decision on purchasing stationery. It should, of course, be exercised in a proportionate manner. But I was driven to lodge these amendments because of an evaluation of the public sector equality duties by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. It would be fair to say that they reported a very mixed picture and they reported that the good intentions were not backed by thought through and measurable outcomes. So we know that the main challenge lies in implementation. Making consideration, therefore, of the public sector equality duty very much a key part of the procurement process will undoubtedly help us move from those good intentions to practical application and implementation. And finally, presiding officer, I take the view that ultimately this bill is about the delivery of public services, the delivery, the delivery of good quality public services. And, you know, irrespective of who delivers those public services, whether it's the private sector, the public sector or the voluntary sector, we should expect the same high standards of delivery. I therefore urge support for amendments 15 and 19 and amendments 31 and 37, which will be covered by Claudia Beamish. Thank you. And I now call Claudia Beamish to speak to amendment 31 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I, I would like to speak to these amendments, uh, which I believe in very strongly. Um, both of which deal with standards of health, well-being and education of communities, as well as animal welfare. Amendment 31 seeks to alter Section 9, placing a requirement on public bodies to consider its policy on food procurement. Specifically, the intention is for public bodies to endeavour to improve the health, well-being and education of communities and promote animal welfare. The policy aim behind that provision on health and well-being is mirrored by the Scottish Government's own guidance, catering for change, buying food sustainably in the public sector. So I see no reason why this cannot be incorporated into the bill itself. We have a lot of good examples of sustainable procurement projects in Scotland today. Examples that immediately spring to mind are better eating, better learning, food for life, food for change, and of course, the good work done by Nourish Scotland and the Soil Association. These amendments require public bodies to emulate these examples and work towards truly sustainable food procurement policies with local supply chains and at the same time further educate the public on the benefits. There is no reason why these, why these methods of procurement cannot be universal and there are no issues, as I understand it, with the EU compliance because East Ayrshire, for example, has demonstrated that this is possible. A clear, explicit reference on the face of the bill, backed by guidance, would ensure that we could make this happen, rather than being dependent on enthusiastic individuals and groups. And further, as Vice Convener of the Cross-Party Group on Animal Welfare, I'm keenly aware that there is always a public interest in animal welfare issues. Of present, at present, of course, there is a debate about the labelling of non-stunned slaughtered meat. More broadly, humane production is a part of food quality and consumers have a right to choose as individuals. Labelling is important, 
There are many culture changes, and there have been in recent years, such as the consciousness of the welfare of chickens leading to free-range egg purchase. And of course, the recent horsemeat scandal has shown that labelling standards must be far more proactively enforced. In the procurement process, millions of animals are affected by the choices made by our public bodies with their substantial purchasing power. So this amendment would ensure animal welfare is a real consideration. Consequen consequentially, passing this amendment means that the procurement strategy required under Section 11 would automatically need to include how public, public body intends to ensure compliance on these issues, as well as including these issues in its annual report. And this further solidifies the foundations upon which this bill is built. Amendment 37 finally seeks to achieve the same policy aim as the amendment I've just spoken to, but is designed to be more light touch in manner. Rather than requiring the public body to, con to consider issues of health, well-being and education of communities and animal welfare standards during each individual food procurement, this provision would instead require the public body to include a general statement on its overall approach. My colleagues and I would, of course, prefer that the more focused and comprehensive Amendment 31 is passed. However, if this proves not to be possible, then I would urge members to vote for this alternative, which I'm sure they will agree is a wholly credible and reasonable compromise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Since another member has requested to speak, I now call the Deputy First Minister. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Can I uh, deal firstly with Amendments 15 and 19? Contractors which are performing what would otherwise be regarded as a public function, whether that's, for example, uh, the running of a prison or another public building, are already subject to the public sector equality duty in relation to that function. Uh, the application of the Equality Act will, of course, have been considered in detail during the consultation and scrutiny process that it went through. Um, so I think there is a, an argument that it wouldn't be right to use this bill to seek to extend duties imposed by other legislation upon public bodies more widely than that. But more fundamentally, uh, equality is already an integral part of this bill. It's part of the sustainable procurement duty. Uh, the guidance that will follow will elaborate on that and will make clear the connection between the equality duty and procurement processes. Uh, we'll be focusing our energy after the passage of this bill today, assuming Parliament does pass it, on the development of that guidance and the regulations and in engaging with stakeholders, including equality stakeholders, in the development of these. So I'm not able to support uh, Amendment 15 or Amendment uh, 19. But I can turn, though, to Amendments 31 and 37. Um, I do think there is a reasonable issue here. The arguments that were put at Stage 2, and I listened very carefully to all of the arguments at Stage 2, make me think or have made me think that there is a, a need to do more to put a specific reference to food procurement given the importance of that on the face of the bill. Amendment 31 would amend the sustainable procurement duty to require purchasers to consider how in conducting a procurement process involving the purchase of food they can improve health, well-being and education of communities and promote the highest standards of animal welfare. Amendment 37 addresses the same issue but does so through the procurement strategy. I think, given some of the definitional issues in here, I am of the view that it is more appropriate and more proportionate to address these issues through the strategy in Section 11 of the Bill, as opposed to creating a new duty under Section 9. So I am happy to support Amendment 37, uh, but I'm not uh, able to support Amendment 31. Thank you very much. I now call Jackie Bailey to wind up and indicate whether you intend to press or withdraw. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Claudia Beamish um, set out the case um, very well for putting food provision um, on the face of the bill. And indeed, the compromise amendment that, that placed it within the procurement strategy. I'm delighted that the Cabinet Secretary appears to be having a very consensual afternoon and she agrees with Amendment 37. I live in hope for the rest. Um, I recognise, however, um, that the Scottish Government has already produced guidance on procurement um, and welcome it is too. But it covers the planning of procurement services, developing a strategy and even encouraging public authorities to undertake equality impact assessments. What is actually less clear is whether any of these assessments have indeed been undertaken and whether any you know, measurable difference has been made. So is there a difference between the government's good intentions and their actual practice and implementation? And the truth is, presiding officer, we just don't know. But you know, if we care 
then let's signal its importance by putting it on the face of the bill, not just in guidance, but actually on the face of the bill. The Cabinet Secretary has done it once this afternoon. Let me encourage her to do it again. And again, I say, if this is a public service, irrespective of whether it's delivered by the public, private or voluntary sector, people have a right to expect the same high standard. And importantly, that includes compliance with public sector equality duties. I move. Many thanks. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. This will be a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15 is yes 44, no 75. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment 31 in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with amendment 15, and to ask Claudia Beamish to move or not move. Uh, to move. That has been moved. The question therefore is that amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. This will be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 31 is yes 44, no 75. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 16 in the name of Jackie Bailey, which has already been debated with amendment 30, and to ask Jackie Bailey to move or not move. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I now call Amendment 32 in the name of Patrick Harvey, which has already been debated with Amendment 30, and I ask Patrick Harvey to move or not move. Moved. The member has moved. The question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. This is a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 32 is yes 10, no 109. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 14 in the name of James Kelly, already debated with amendment 11, and to ask James Kelly to move or not move. Move. 
Member has moved. The question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 14 is yes 44, no 75. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. And that brings us to group four. Circumstances where participation is restricted or no offer sought. And I call amendment 33 in the name of Mary Fee, which is grouped with amendments 35 and 36. And I ask Mary Fee to move amendment 33 and to speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Amendment 33 aims to enable and support the third sector in the procurement process. The third sector often provides high, higher levels of care and innovation across a range of services, yet are often excluded due to the size and costs associated with participating in procurement contracts. The Alliance briefing for the Bill shows that a history of competitive tendering processes has acted as a barrier to the third sector, and many have completely disengaged with the process, even when this service could have made great contribution. And we need to support and protect our third sector, and excluding specific contracts in specific circumstances would do that. This proposal is similar to that of supported businesses and would bring long-lasting benefits to the third sector who have had to work with tightened budgets and increasing pressure over recent years. Amendment 35 would require ministers to lay regulations specifying what a health and social care service is for the purpose of this bill, rather than it being an option, and would guarantee clarity for contracting authorities and guidance in my view, cannot be an option in a health and social care sector. Amendment 36 again would require ministers to lay regulation and guidance, specifying what regulated contracts may be awarded without seeking offers, again encouraging and enabling participation. And I move Amendment 33 in my name. Thank you. Thank you. Since no other member has requested to speak, I call on the Deputy First Minister. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Amendment 33, as uh, we've just heard from Mary Fee, would allow public bodies to limit participation in a regulated procurement to third sector bodies. Um, I said at stage two, and I'll repeat again today, I'm sympathetic to the aim of that amendment, but I don't believe it would be EU law compliant, and I'll explain uh, in a bit more detail why that is the case. It might, of course, be possible in the case of some procurement exercises to restrict competition to the third sector, but that depends on the particular circumstances of the competition. In some cases, the treaty obligations which flow from EU law will apply even at the contract values within the scope of the bill. Restricting competition in such cases would be discriminatory and therefore incompatible with EU law. Uh, one question we have been asked, and it's a, an obvious question, uh, is how is it that we can limit competition to supported businesses, as we do in this bill, uh, but not limit competition to the third sector? And the straightforward answer is the EU procurement law makes specific provision to restrict competition to supported businesses. It doesn't make specific provision for the third sector, which is a much broader category of organisations. Uh, while we can't accept Amendment 33, I would still like to emphasise the importance we attach to the third sector's role in delivering public services. Our response to the Christie Commission report on the future delivery of public services emphasised that the third sector has a crucial role to play because of its specialist expertise, its ability to engage with vulnerable groups and its ability, which I think is particularly important, to be flexible and innovative. Indeed, one of the four priorities at the heart of this bill is improving access to public sector contracts, particularly for small businesses and third sector organisations. If I can turn now to Amendment 35, uh, the power in subsection 3 of section 10A 
is drafted to be consistent with other subordinate legislation provisions in the Bill. It is the Government's intention to bring forward regulations under this power, so changing the may to a must will have no practical effect. Uh, the amendment is therefore unnecessary, uh, but it would also lead to inconsistent legislation. Uh, amendment 36, uh, on a similar, uh, in a similar vein, uh, it is not necessary. The power in section 10c is drafted to be consistent with other powers uh, that are already in the Bill, uh, and Ministers do have discretion in how that power is to be exercised. So the may here, and the use of the term may at this part of the Bill, is absolutely uh, appropriate. So uh, with those uh, comments, uh, I would ask that these amendments are not approved. Many thanks. I now invite Mary Fee to wind up and indicate if you wish to press or withdraw. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Deputy First Minister for her um, comments. We heard a lot in evidence um, about this bill being an enabling piece of legislation, and I think it is incumbent upon us as politicians to support and encourage our third sector and the valuable work that they do. And restricting contracts to the third sector would level the playing field, as it does in helping supported businesses. And restriction would also allow for continuity of care and support, whose value is immeasurable to those that are receiving care, and also it, it, it gives um, continuity to those providing the care. And while I absolutely accept the sympathy offered by the, the Deputy First Minister, we need more than sympathy, and we need action to support this sector. And in relation to Amendments 35 and 36, and the remarks made around um, ministers and their discretion in guidance, I am not confident that allowing ministers to have discretion will give us the level of guidance that we need. And I will be pressing all my amendments. Thank you. Many thanks. The question then is that Amendment 33 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. This is a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 33 is yes 42, no 76. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment 35 in the name of Mary Fee, which has already been debated with amendment 33, and I ask Mary Fee to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The member has moved. The question therefore is that amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. This is a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 35 is yes 42, no 76. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. And I now call amendment 36 in the name of Mary Fee, which has already been debated with amendment 33. And I ask Mary Fee to move or not move. Move. The member has moved. The question is that amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
Parliament has not agreed. This will be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 36 is yes 42, no 76. There was one abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. That now brings us to group five, supported businesses. And I call amendment two in the name of Mark Griffin, which is grouped with amendments 20 and three. And I ask Mark Griffin to move amendment two and to speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you, President Officer. I move amendment two and I uh, rise to speak in support of Amendment 2 and 3 in, in my name. These amendments apply only to public bodies in Scotland who have procurement activity amounting to £5 million or more. Now, as I, as I stated at Stage 2, I do not think that that is unreasonable of us to expect a public authority who is spending over £5 million to award at least one contract to a supported business. The amendments which I have tabled seek to achieve the Government's own stated policy ambition in the supported business framework that public authorities should award at least one contract to a supported business. These amendments do not say that an authority must award a contract to a supported business, but simply ask them to set out how they are working towards the Government's own aim. The Deputy First Minister made comments at Stage 2 on the amendments which I have tabled again and has also tabled a government amendment which I support as it is a move in the, the right direction. Now, but the Deputy First Minister did say she had two particular issues um, with the drafting of my amendments, but did, did have sympathy for them. Firstly, that the amendments um, would require public authorities to, and I quote, effectively um, ask public authorities to look into a crystal ball by asking them to look ahead to what procurement activity they could restrict to supported business. Now, on the surface, that might seem reasonable, but actually, when you look at section 14 of the bill on annual procurement reports, and in particular 2D, that line states in the annual procurement report should include a summary of the regulated procurements the authority expects to commence in the next two financial years. Now, if contracting authorities can set out a summary of the regu regulated procurements that they expect to commence in the next two years, then why would it be so difficult for an authority to set out where it intends to restrict procurement to a supported business in a single year? The second point of objection was that the Deputy First Minister did not want to set the bar too low in terms of procurement from supported business, that we should not simply allow public authorities to simply tick it off as a good deed done for the year. And I completely agree with the Deputy First Minister, but there are public authorities in Scotland today that are not even hitting that low bar of a single contract with a supported business. In a response to FOI requests submitted to public authorities across Scotland, there are 44 of those in Scotland who do not have a single contract with a supported business. Those are insignificant public authorities with low levels of procurement. They range from health boards, government bodies and local authorities right across the country. And while I agree entirely with the Deputy First Minister that we don't want to set a minimum level so that authorities think they don't have to go beyond that level, but when so many in such large bodies are not even awarding a single contract, then I think it's about time that we started pushing harder and a, movement, a move amendment to in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I call the Deputy First Minister, can I ask the Chamber if members could take their conversations outside of the Chamber, please? I call the Deputy First Minister to speak to Amendment 20 and other amendments in the group. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Helping supported businesses is very important to the Government generally and also in relation to procurement. And that 
commitment was reflected in the bill uh, as drafted, and I think all members would uh, accept that. At stage two, though, I did give a commitment to the Infrastructure Committee that I'd consider what more might be done, uh, in particular in relation to the reporting of levels of engagement with supported businesses, because I think Mark Griffin makes a reasonable point uh, that we need to ensure that our expectations of public bodies are delivered in, in practice. Um, as a result of that, I am pleased to bring forward Amendment 20. Uh, that will require public bodies who prepare an annual report to include in that report a summary of the steps taken to facilitate the involvement of supported businesses in regulated procurements during the year covered by the report. Uh, that's got the same overall effect uh, or a very similar overall effect to Amendment 3. I think it is preferable to Amendment 3, though. Um, Amendment 3, as Mark Griffin has alluded to, refers to, uh, and I quote, at least one contract to a supported business. Now, I would absolutely agree with Mark Griffin that that is not an unreasonable expectation, and we should be very firm in our expectation uh, that we expect uh, public authorities doing procurement processes to have at least one contract with supported businesses. But I do want to be very careful that we don't send a signal to public bodies that says just one is enough. We shouldn't be playing to the minimum on what is a very important issue. And I think Amendment 20 uh, gives Mark Griffin what he is seeking in terms of reporting uh, without uh, that limitation that I think would be a concern. Uh, Amendments 2 and 3. Amendment 2 would require public bodies to state in the corporate procurement strategy. And I think, um, I apologise to Mark Griffin if I picked him up wrongly in his opening speech, but I think it is important to distinguish between uh, procurement strategy and the reports on procurement strategies, which I, I think he may have slightly uh, mixed up in uh, some of the points he was making. But Amendment 2 would require public bodies to state in their strategy whether they intend to restrict competition to supported businesses and how they intend to ensure that they award at least one contract to supported business. I won't repeat my points about playing to the minimum of saying one contract is enough. My objection uh, here is the one that Mark Griffin described as the crystal ball uh, objection, and I think that was quite a good description to be uh, very fair to him. But because this is talking about the strategy which a public authority has to prepare at the start of a year, what would effectively be asking public authorities to do is to decide at the start of the year whether at any point during that year they intended to run a procurement that would be appropriate to restrict to supported businesses. And in the procurement strategy, if this amendment was passed, they'd be expected to be pretty definitive about uh, that. But at the start of the year, they won't necessarily know what all of the requirements for procurement uh, will be throughout the year. So I think we would just be putting on the face of the bill something that in a practical sense would be very difficult to the point of impossible for public authorities to meaningfully deliver. Um, and I would ask Mark Griffin, as I asked him at stage two, just to think about that practical objection uh, to the amendment. Uh, that said, and as I've repeated today, I am sympathetic, more than sympathetic actually, totally in agreement with the intent behind these amendments, especially in relation to reporting, uh, because you know, the, it's the reporting that will let us ensure that uh, our expectations are being delivered, and that's precisely what Amendment 20 is seeking to address. So I would ask uh, Mark Griffin to withdraw Amendment 2, uh, not move Amendment 3, and I would ask the Chamber uh, to support Amendment 20. Thank you. Can I invite Mark Griffin to wind up and indicate an intention to press or withdraw? Thank you, President Officer. I thank the, the Cabinet Secretary for her comments and that movement, as I said earlier, um, and the lodging of Amendment 20. I think the point I made around the, the procurement strategies and um, annual reports was that in annual reports, um, a public authority is, is expected to look forward two years to the procurement it would be carrying out. And so I, I didn't find a great difficulty in a procurement strategy of asking a public authority to look forward one year to identify areas where they could um, restrict procurement to a supported business, which would then allow the supported businesses around Scotland a lot more um, confidence in, in where their, their work was coming from. The, the, the main thrust of these amendments, though, is about allowing the government to make, through a procurement strategy, its own policy to to have every public authority in Scotland having a contract with at least one business. I don't want to see every, every public authority across Scotland simply having one contract. But I think this step is required to push the ones who are falling below that even low bar um, to meet that standard. There are 44 public authorities in Scotland who don't have a single contract 
with the supported business. As I said at the outset, these are not insignificant. These are local authorities. These are health boards and central government organisations. And with that in mind, I intend to press my amendments. Thank you. Many thanks. In that case, the question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. This is a one-minute division. Please press your voting buttons now. The result of the vote on amendment number two is yes 43, no 76. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. I now call amendment six in the name of the Deputy First Minister, which has already been debated with amendment 11. And I ask the Deputy First Minister to move formally, please. Moved. Thank you. Question is that amendment six be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. We now move to Group 6, consideration to be given to various employment practices. And I call Amendment 17 in the name of Jim Eady, which is grouped with Amendments 24, 42 and 43. And I ask Jim Eady to move Amendment 17 and to speak to all amendments in the group. And I ask for the best of order for Mr Eady to do so, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak to Amendment 17. This amendment seeks to promote compliance by contractors and subcontractors with the provisions of the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. The purpose of this, act, of this amendment is to extend the minimum content that a corporate procurement strategy should contain to include a statement of the authority's general policy on promoting compliance with health and safety legislation. This amendment places a requirement on those contracting authorities which are compelled by the Bill to produce a corporate procurement strategy to include in that strategy a statement of the authority's general policy on promoting compliance with the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 and any provisions made under that Act. Health and safety did not feature in the public consultation on the policy content of the Bill. I am therefore indebted to Cathy Jenkins of, Scottish, of the Scottish Hazards Campaign Group and Louise Taggart of Families Against Corporate Killers, two campaign groups focused on improving health and safety in the workplace, thereby reducing the toll of work-related death, injury and illness. Both organisations recognise that good work has been done to date by the Scottish Government, but believe that this additional step could further enhance the public sector's role in driving good practice on health and safety. If the provisions of this amendment are implemented across the public sector in Scotland, it would be a very welcome development and go some way towards helping reduce the incidence of family members having to hear that a death could and should have been prevented had an employer only complied with its health and safety duties. This amendment will allow us to embed health and safety into the foundations of our procurement strategy. This being so, I hope the Deputy First Minister will welcome my amendment and support its inclusion in the Bill. Many thanks. I now call Jackie Bailey to speak to Amendment 24 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There is a postcard on the notice board in my office that reads, prepare your daughter for working life, give her less pocket money than your son. It is disappointingly still the case today that there is a gender pay gap with women earning on average less than men. And that's despite good legislation with the Equal Pay Act and undoubtedly good intention in this chamber. But the lesson here is that it is not enough to have legislation in and of itself. It is the implementation that makes the difference. 
So equal pay audits are a key implementation tool. Now, members will know that equal pay audits consider gender gaps, uh, gender pay gaps. They also consider pay gaps by ethnicity, disability and working pattern. They are relatively easy to carry out. There's lots of support for employers, including toolkits and hands-on advice about how to conduct an equal pay audit and what to do with the results. You know, it really is as easy as ABC. But it is what you do with the information that you get that is absolutely crucial. The benefits for business are well documented, improved productivity, improved staff retention, improved performance, all positives that we can agree on. Many employers recognise that the greatest asset they have is in fact their workforce. So it's not good for the quality of their product or service if one set of employees is treated differently from another set of employees because they happen to be female or they happen to be disabled. And taking action to close the gap sets those businesses ahead of their competitors. So what's not to like? At stage two, the Cabinet Secretary said she wasn't sure that this would be consistent with our obligations under EU law on equal treatment of suppliers. But, you know, already in the bill, public bodies can and will make judgments about what matters to them in deciding contracts. They will be deciding who gets a contract and who doesn't on a range of different criteria. These all appear to fit with our EU obligations. So why not this? And if the Cabinet Secretary was being consistent, she would recognise that this fits too. And again, the Cabinet Secretary at stage two defaulted to a mantra of not on the face of the bill, but it will be considered in guidance. Let me just encourage the Cabinet Secretary to break free from her civil servants, because by supporting Amendment 24, she can make a positive difference to enhancing equality in relation to pay, something that will be warmly welcomed by women and disabled people across this country. Many thanks. I now call on Ken McIntosh to speak to Amendment 42 and other amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I want to speak to Amendments 42 and 43 in my own name and also support all amendments in this group. I'd also like to draw members' attention uh, to my uh, trade union membership as declared in the Register of Interests. Presiding Officer, as with this bill as a whole, I'm torn between praising the Scottish Government for recognising the power of procurement to shape the moral economy and chastising it for not following their own reasoning and doing so much more. The two amendments in my name are designed to help capture in legislation the whole concept of the decent job, not work at any price, not exploitative, demeaning or impoverishing jobs, but sustainable employment which recognises the importance and dignity of work. Although they voted against this at stage two, I am very pleased the Scottish Government has recognised the strength of the arguments in favour of trade union recognition. Political discussion in our country often portrays the economy as riven by a clash of interest between employer and trade union, when all the evidence demonstrates that success and prosperity depends on partnership between the two. That collaborative approach allowed the German economy to withstand the worst of the recession. Research overwhelmingly suggests that recognising trade unions will improve the health and safety of our workplaces. And in the context of this bill in particular, Amendment 43 will ensure that public funds are used more effectively. Trade unions remain at the heart of the efficient delivery of, de of all of Scotland's public services, from the NHS to the rail industry. We need to extend that thinking and that government in all its forms uh, behaves and follows that, that thinking. Quite simply, if companies like Amazon fail to pay their taxes, refuse to recognise trade unions and employ workers on zero hours contracts, then they should not be receiving public funds. I particularly want to thank uh, my own trade union community, a progressive trade union, which I'm very proud to be a member of, who originally proposed this amendment. And I congratulate the Scottish Government for working with community and trade union colleagues in the STUC in drafting the amendment before us this afternoon, uh, what I believe could be a landmark uh, amendment recognising trade unions here in Scotland. Amendment 42 is essentially about promoting equality and it would allow the Scottish Government to encourage employers to minimise wage ratios between the highest and the lowest paid. Presenting officer, it is worth reminding ourselves that the majority of people uh, living in poverty in our country are not unemployed, they come from working households. The vast majority of Scots will also be only too aware that over the last four years wages have failed to keep, peace, keep pace with rising prices. 
from food to fuel bills. But it is certainly not the case that we are all in this together. Convener, uh, President Officer, in 2012, the average chief executive of a FTSE 100 company was paid £4.8 million per year, or 185 times the average salary. And this has risen from £1.2 million in 1999. According to the Equality Trust, wage ratios in the voluntary sector are estimated to be around 10 to 1, in the public sector to be roughly 15 to 1, and in FTSE 100 companies to be approximately 262 to 1. Presenting officer, there are many steps the Scottish Government can take to reduce that wage gap and to promote equality. In the education sector alone, I would simply highlight the contrast between the pay and wage increases enjoyed by university principals and the widespread use of zero-hours contracts. In public procurement, the Equality Trust again have estimated that none of the large public service industry organisations, those are the companies that carry out this work, none of them paid their chief executive officer less than 59 times UK median earnings. One example in particular would be Serco. Their previous chief executive was paid an estimated £3.1 million in 2010. That's six times more than the highest paid UK public servant, 11 times more than the highest paid local authority chief executive. Presiding officer, research demonstrates that reducing inequality is just one of the ways we can promote faster and more durable economic growth. The Cabinet Secretary said she agreed with my arguments on these amendments at stage two, but then encouraged members to vote against them. If she shares Labour's desire to build a more resilient, a more sustainable and a more ethical economy, I urge her not just to have sympathy with the arguments, but in this case to vote for both amendments. Many thanks. Uh, Deputy First Minister. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Can I take the amendments in this group in turn, um, starting with Amendment 17? Uh, I support Amendment 17, which is in Jim Eady's name. Uh, that amendment will ensure that public bodies set out their policies on the very important issue of health and safety. Uh, nothing we purchase should ever be at the expense of the safety of those who are involved in its manufacturing, construction or provision. Um, 24, um, very few people, in fact, I hope nobody would disagree that equal pay audits bring benefits and clarity uh, to both the employer and the employee alike. Promoting equal pay for equal work uh, is something I hope each and every one of us in this chamber uh, agrees with wholeheartedly. Uh, and of course, the Scottish Government is committed to the reduction of the gender pay gap. We've got a significant programme of work underway, which is aimed at increasing women's economic participation, tackling occupational segregation, and reducing gender imbalances throughout uh, public life. Uh, I uh, do take the view that it is outrageous uh, that the Equal Pay Act, which uh, I say, can say uh, at fear of uh, giving away my age, which everybody will know anyway, was passed in the year I was born, is still not fully implemented. And I think it speaks badly of successive Westminster governments that it has not been fully uh, implemented over these 43, nearly 44 years. Uh, pay discrimination on the basis of any other protected characteristic uh, is also uh, equally unacceptable. Uh, Jackie Bailey said rightly, and you know, I, I'll say it again today, that uh, we do not think that limiting competition to companies who have conducted an equal pay audit would be consistent with our EU law, law obligations regarding equal treatment of suppliers. For example, it could uh, potentially exclude biz bidders who haven't carried out an audit but who are nevertheless complying fully with equal pay requirements. Uh, she also said that the bill, although I think her speech in this respect was written before I uh, conceded one of our earlier amendments, uh, the bill, of course, does provide for guidance to be issued on how workforce-related matters should be considered in a procurement context. And I'm happy to repeat the commitment I've given consistently throughout this legislation to consider uh, this issue in the context of that guidance. Uh, it's for very similar reasons that I'm not able uh, to support Ken McIntosh's amendment 42. Uh, mandatory contractual obligations, whether we like it or not, can only be imposed in procurement where they're relevant and proportionate to the actual subject matter of the contract. Uh, if I can turn to Amendment 43, uh, Ken McIntosh lodged an amendment at stage two, uh, which I uh, said I did uh, agree with. The 
uh, notion that effective employee representation and trade union recognition are important and are to be supported. Um, I did have a reservation about the amendment he lodged at stage two, uh, and I highlighted that a clear regime is already in place under the Trade Union and Labour Relations Act 1992, which includes measures concerning the recognition of trade unions. But I was keen to see if we could reach agreement on an amendment about trade union recognition. And I'm very pleased that Ken McIntosh took me up on the offer of further dialogue to see if we could agree a positive approach that we would both find acceptable. And in light of that, we have Amendment 43, which Ken McIntosh has put forward, and I'm very happy to support. So in conclusion, I support Jimmy D's Amendment 17, Ken McIntosh's Amendment 43, uh, but not Amendments uh, 24 and 42. Many thanks. Uh, Jim Eady, to wind up and press to withdraw your amendments, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the comments by the Deputy First Minister and the support that has been forthcoming uh, from the Scottish Government. I'm grateful that the Government has both listened to and acted upon the representations which it has received on the issue of health and safety. I move Amendment 17. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Did I hear a no? I didn't. Thank you. So we are agreed. We now move to Group 7 and the call Amendment 18 in the name of Claudia Beamish, Group Amendment 21, 22, 26 and 27. Claudia Beamish to move Amendment 18 and speak to all other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As, um, as you have highlighted, I would like to speak to my Amendments 18, 21, 22, 26 and 27, all of which address the issue of climate change in the procurement process. The policy aim behind these amendments is to ensure that the greenhouse gas emissions associated with goods and services procured are taken into account by the contracting authority when making a decision about who is granted the contract. During the stage two process, I lodged amendments that were intended to place a climate change duty on contracting authorities, which would require them to receive, to receive the, from the economic operator a statement setting out the climate change impact of any contract greater or equal to £4 million. The contracting authority would have also had to have included in its, in its award statement uh, a notice uh, stating that the, what the climate change impact was. However, I have decided not to relodge these amendments, which are quite specific at stage three, and have instead gone for a more light touch set of amendments, which still emphasise the importance of greenhouse gas emissions in the procurement process, but in a way that I believe is more manageable, both for the contracting authority and the operator. I see this as an initial step to build on in the future. Of course, one of the most evident ways in which greenhouse gas emissions can be reduced in the procurement process is through the addressing of the transportation of goods. I recently met with a group of medical students from Edinburgh University who have researched the possibility of having hospital food sourced more, more locally, and I am well convinced by their arguments. Currently, some of the food provided at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary is sourced from Trowbridge in South England, which produces many unnecessary greenhouse emissions through fuel and freeze, freeze storage. Sourcing more food from Scotland would not only have the positive impact on carbon emissions, but would also result in fresher local food for patients. And this is surely something that can be looked at by the NHS and other public bodies. My stage three amendments seek to add additional aspects to the existing duties in the bill. I've tried to keep these as simple as possible. Section 11 requires contracting authorities, which expect to have significant procurement, procurement expenditure, to produce a procurement strategy, which I, agree is, which I believe is a sensible provision. With 18, I suggest that the statement required to be produced by the contracting authority should include how its procurements can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As the provisions, as they currently stand, require the statement to address community benefit and now after stage two, fair trade. I believe this would be an appropriate place to incorporate, incorporate these climate change obligations. My amendment th uh, 21 seeks to amend section 14, which requires the contracting authority produce an, to produce an annual procurement report related to its strategy. Again, I see no reason why climate change cannot be included in these reports. This would be consistent with my intention for climate change to be addressed in the strategy. My amendments 22, 26 and 27 are consequential amendments related to the two I have just described. I am aware that the Scottish Government does not agree so far with my intentions with regard to including climate change provisions. 
and have argued that the Climate Change Act already covers these issues, making my amendments perhaps a needless duplication. However, I believe my proposed amendments would highlight the importance of greenhouse gas emissions in the procurement process itself and reinforce the provisions found in the Climate Change Act where procurement is not specifically addressed. I recognise the challenges faced by public bodies such as COSLA in taking forward such a requirement. However, these rethought amendments are drafted in order to enable relevant regulation to be implemented in a simple and time-sensitive way. There are carbon assessment tools available and already in effective use. The regulations could, of course, be revised as necessary. I hope members and indeed the Cabinet Secretary will agree with me that if we are actually to achieve our climate change targets, the issue of greenhouse gas emissions must be addressed in other legislation where applicable, not just in the Climate Change Act itself, and underline the cross-party commitment to addressing this most pressing global challenge by adopting it within the, within the procurement bill. Thus, I hope the Cabinet Secretary will still consider these amendments today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deputy First Minister. The purpose of these amendments is to require public bodies to provide a statement on their approach to using procurement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the procurement strategy and to require detailed reporting on the emissions produced and how these have been calculated. Uh, I stress at stage two that, uh, and uh, Claudia Beamish has uh, covered some of this territory in her own contribution, uh, that climate change duties already exist under the Climate Change Act 2009. Specifically, that Act provides ministers with a power to make provision, and I quote, requiring relevant public bodies to prepare reports on compliance with climate change duties, and that any such report, again I quote, must in particular contain information relating to how procurement policies of relevant public bodies and procurement activity by relevant public bodies have contributed to compliance with climate change duties. Uh, the recently established Public Sector Climate Leaders Forum, on which Claudia Beamish sits as an observer, is currently looking at the issue of standardised reporting against the public body's duties in the Climate Change Scotland Act. Claudia Beamish herself used in her contribution the term uh, needless duplication, uh, although she attributed it to me, not to, to herself, in relation to her amendments. But, but I do think it is the appropriate uh, description of, of these amendments, and I say that uh, you know, as uh, politely as possible, because I don't doubt the intention behind the amendments she's put forward. As we developed this bill, the strong view that was expressed, particularly by local government stakeholders, was that existing legislation on climate change and the environment uh, already establishes significant duties, and I've read out uh, what the terms of those duties are, and that to impose additional duties uh, wouldn't necessarily add anything to what is already contained in other legislation. Of course, the bill specifically covers the environment through the general duty on sustainability and in doing so it leaves public bodies with quite an important degree of flexibility that will allow them to take a pragmatic and meaningful approach to dealing with environmental issues in their procurement activity. So uh, given those comments and given in particular uh, my comments and indeed quotations from the Climate Change uh, Act 2009, uh, I would ask Claudia Beamish to reflect on the fact that we would be uh, legislating here for uh, needless duplication uh, and ask her to withdraw Amendment 18 and not to move my Amendments 21, 22, 26 and 27. Thank you very much. Claudia Beamish, to wind up and press to withdraw your amendment, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've listened with care to what the Cabinet Secretary says. I am still minded to press my amendments because I do believe that I've, I've tried to make them as light touch as possible and that while, as the Cabinet Secretary says, that the climate change duties are there, and I do understand the delicacy of moving forward um, collectively with COSLA and other public bodies, I want to see this on the face of the bill because I think it's a very important aspect of, um, of, of the bill which sends a clear message and continues to enable us to be um, climate leaders um, in our field. And the tools will be developed um, and become more sophisticated as time goes on. And therefore, I, I believe that it's important that, uh, that I do press these amendments. Thank you. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will therefore be a division. This will be a one-minute division.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 18 is yes, 44, no, 75. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 19 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 15. Jackie Bailey to move or not? Moved. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will therefore be a division, and this will be a 30-second division. To the vote on amendment number 19 is yes 43, no 75. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 37 in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with amendment 15. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? Uh, to move. Thank you. So the question is that amendment 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 37 is yes 103, no 12. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore agreed. Now call amendment 7 in the name of the Deputy First Minister. Already debated with amendment 11. Deputy First Minister to move please. Moved. So the question is that amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. Now call amendment 20 in the name of the Deputy First Minister. Uh, Deputy First Minister to move. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. We are agreed. Call Amendment 21 in the name of Claudia Beamish. Uh, Claudia Beamish, to move or not move? Uh, to move. Thank you very much. And the question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in amendment number 21 is yes 44, no 75. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 3 in the name of Mark Griffin. Mr Griffin to move or not moved? Move. Thank you. So the question is that amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number three is yes, 43, no, 75. There were no abstentions. Seven, I beg your pardon. There were 76 no's, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. Now call amendment 22 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with amendment 18. 
Uh, Ms Beamish, to move or not move? Uh, to move. Not moved. Move. Moved. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in amendment number 22 is yes 45, no 74. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move to group 8 and I call amendment 38 in the name of Jackie Bailey in a group on its own. Uh, Jackie Bailey to move and speak to amendment 38 please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. If anything, this amendment proves that persistence does eventually pay off. Um, more will be explained later. But I did, in fact, bring in an amendment at stage two calling for an annual report so that we could measure activity across the public sector, allowing Parliament to consider the overall success of our approach, or if there are shortcomings, to understand and improve them. Now, with £10 billion spent each year by the public sector on procurement, it is right for us to have the highest standards of accountability and transparency. And rather than chasing down reports from every public sector body, this brings the information together in one report to paint a picture of Scotland as a whole. There are, of course, precedents for such an approach that transcend political parties, that transcend governments, and occur in every session of this Parliament. At stage two, I drew attention to Peter Peacock and Liam MacArthur's amendments calling for annual reports, Rosanna Cunningham and Paul Wheelhouse in government both bringing forward amendments for annual reports. So an amendment calling for an annual report is nothing unusual. I'm therefore that whilst the Cabinet Secretary declined the advances at stage two, she has agreed with the proposition. And the amendment that I move today has government approval. Now let's be honest. This doesn't exactly happen often, so I'm extremely tempted to rush to the vote before the Cabinet Secretary changes her mind. But it is fair to say that our colleagues in COSLA didn't wish to see additional reporting burdens and a proportionate way has been arrived at to capture the information required. And I am grateful to the government for securing that and to COSLA and local authorities for their support. It would be equally fair to say that when I tabled my amendment at stage two, certain civil servants had visions of masses of reports from every public sector body landing on their desk. Indeed, members of the bill team threatened the head of procurement policy branch, one Ian Moore, with exactly that. On that basis, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will agree with me that we should henceforth call this the Ian Moore Amendment. That said, I hope he is getting a bigger desk to receive all these reports. Presiding officer, I move Amendment 38. Many thanks. And I call on Nigel Don. Much, presiding officer, and I'd like to consider very briefly what subsection 3, which means that the government will have to consider things that it might think are appropriate, to, uh, might mean for small contractors. I'd like to briefly discuss the effectiveness of the policy and the mechanisms for enforcement. Uh, I guess at this point I may be wearing my cross-party group on construction conveners hat and I'd like to reflect on the concerns which the engineering contractors, concerns which will be shared across all small contractors, have about the mechanisms which are in the bill to deal with the situation where public procurement is not handled properly. I simply want to re concern myself with the fact that they believe that very small businesses will not be taking procurers to court. That is the reality. Um, and they feel that an ombudsman would be an appropriate way forward. I would like also to recognise that I've had discussions with the government. The Cabinet Secretary is very well aware of this. She has given me a response which I well understand and accept. Uh, I think there is an opportunity in the future to address this. I am not pressing her to do so now. But I do suggest there is an opportunity, if reports are going to be made, to consider whether that might be something to, 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 to look at in the process of seeing how this bill beds in so that we can get to the right answer maybe a bit quicker. Thank you. First Minister. 
Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Obviously, as Jackie Bailey uh, said earlier on, I'm taking an entirely consensual approach to this bill this afternoon. And in case any of my colleagues uh, are wondering if I've taken leave of my senses, I think this is the second of Jackie Bailey's amendment that I'm going to vote for. Can I just say there is method uh, in, in my madness here. I've, I've detected the fact that it annoys Jackie Bailey more when I remove her ability <laughs> to engage in unjustified rants against the government. So that's why I've decided to be so consensual. Uh, seriously, though, um, I made very clear at stage two that uh, I agree that effective reporting on procurement performance is extremely important. It's only by effectively reporting uh, that we know whether our expectations and the obligations in this bill are being properly implemented. Uh, the reason I declined Jackie Bailey's advances at stage two was not to put too fine a point on it, that her amendment was badly drafted and I thought we could draft it slightly better and make it more consistent with the aims and objectives that we were trying to achieve. So I did offer to work with her uh, prior to stage three and I'm pleased uh, that the result of that work uh, has been an ability to support Amendment 38, which will result in the publication of an annual report in a manner that recognises and respects the ethos of the broader procurement reform agenda of working in partnership across the sectors. And whether or not it delivers uh, more work for Ian Moore, more in uh, the procurement division, time will uh, tell. Uh, in relation to Nigel Don's points, uh, he has, uh, as he has said, uh, taken great care to raise his particular issues of concern. There have been discussions between Nigel Dawn and my officials about how we address uh, those issues as we move forward with the procurement reform agenda. I'm very happy that those discussions continue uh, and that we uh, seek to uh, involve Nigel Dawn in them as we develop our thinking around issues like an ombudsman and uh, the particular issues he raised. Uh, so with those comments, uh, presiding officer, I'm happy to support Amendment 38. Many thanks. Uh, Jackie Bailey to wind up and I take it to press her amendment. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I intend to press the amendment. Could I, at the outset, reject the notion that the amendment was badly drafted? I think we have some very superb parliamentary staff who do draft very competent amendments, and that really is the excuse that, that we should have moved on from a long time ago. Can I say, though, that, that at the danger of not of misquoting the, the Deputy First Minister, she hasn't been entirely consensual about the whole bill. I think she won't have found me saying that she has been in that respect. But I do welcome the newfound consensus um, that she has arrived at with me. I also welcome support for all the other amendments that I would draw her attention to, but she seems not willing to move on those. Can I just say to her in passing, presiding officer, my husband has always said that he's found it's preferable to agree with me um, rather than disagree. Can I encourage the Cabinet Secretary to do likewise? Yeah. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 38... Be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. I now call Amendment 39 in the name of Sarah Boyett. Claudia Beamish to move or not move? To move. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 39 is yes, 44, no, 74, there were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move on to group 9 and I call amendment 41 in the name of Mary Fee, group to the amendment 23. Mary Fee to move amendment 41 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. 
Officer, and as my amendment is a fairly straightforward one, I will be brief in, in moving my amendment. If the aim of the Procurement Bill is to reform and increase the economic, social and environmental well-being of communities, then let's get behind that principle and reduce the level of community benefit threshold from 4 million to 2, which would greatly improve the opportunity to bring benefits to all our communities through economic, social and environmental action. Reducing the community threshold benefit from 4 million to 2 would maximise the benefit we could bring to not only to communities but to individuals across Scotland. Amendment um, 20 in the name of Jackie Bailey would require data to be collected to demonstrate what benefit is being achieved as a result of a contract including a community benefit requirement and would allow these benefits to be assessed and monitored. We need clarity, transparency and accountability in procurement and the amendment in the name of Jackie Bailey would assist in this process and I move amendment 41 in my name. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Jackie Bailey to speak to Amendment 23 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wish to speak in support of Amendment 23. There are undoubtedly some excellent um, community benefit policies and practices, and we are learning all the time. And I hope that the Procurement Bill does indeed spread that good practice more widely and that we become increasingly better at securing positive outcomes. I was given a recent example of really positive community benefit policies with the Commonwealth Games, but I was also told that we didn't know the extent to which the organisations that are contracting with the Games are improving, for example, women's chances in industries in which they are currently underrepresented because we're not collecting the data that would actually help them make that assessment. So we know there's a difficulty in getting workplace data, whether it's from the Commonwealth Games or indeed from arm's length organisations. If we are to be able to judge whether community benefit clauses are truly effective and learn for the future, then we absolutely, as a baseline requirement, need to collect appropriate data. It is a bit of a no-brainer. At stage one, the Cabinet Secretary appeared to support the approach I had suggested. At stage two, she was at pains to say that she and I were in agreement about the need for good quality data collection, but the difference was in how we achieved it. She referred to blanket approaches to community benefit clauses being unhelpful in capturing the nuance and diversity of these. But I have to say, and I say this genuinely, I think she misunderstands the purpose of my amendment. This amendment sets out a requirement to collect data. It doesn't tell you exactly what data it wishes to be collected or how to do so. It would be a matter of detail which is properly for ministers and properly for guidance. I even went so far as to give a power for ministers to set out in guidance how that should be done. So you can collect data in a way that captures the nuance and the diversity in contracts. There is no rational reason for resisting this amendment. The amendment is entirely motivated, presiding officer, by a desire to understand and learn from our experience. It cannot be right that we should have community benefit clauses, but do not measure them in a way that allows proper scrutiny and analysis. So I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to change her mind, to support this amendment, and I hope that she will again demonstrate that where we agree, she is willing to make progress by supporting Amendment 23. Thank you. Deputy First Minister. Uh, amendment 41 seeks to reduce the threshold for contracts where contracting authorities must consider imposing community benefit requirements. As has been explained previously, the rationale behind uh, the current threshold of £4 million is that this is essentially the same level as the level at which public works contracts are covered by the EU Public Procurement Directive. Uh, that's a widely recognised level and it seems to be a fairly simple and straightforward approach. Uh, it's also important to point out that the threshold was subject to consultation and the majority of respondents supporting, uh, supported the threshold that was set out in the bill. Um, that said, I've, I've said repeatedly as this bill has gone through Parliament that I'm not wedded to this threshold and that I intend to keep the threshold under review. And it's worth reminding members that Section 20 enables the threshold to be amended by order if after review that is considered appropriate. But I really do think that any change to the threshold should follow such a review. It shouldn't be made arbitrarily at this stage, because whether or not you agree 
with £4 million as the threshold, there is a rationale for setting it at that level. There is no similar uh, easily understandable rationale for setting the threshold at £2 million, other than it is half of what uh, the threshold is uh, at the moment. Uh, so uh, I say again, this will be kept under review, and if after due review it is considered that it would be appropriate to change the threshold, we will use the powers that are already in the Bill to do that by order. And I think the other point I've made previously, and I'll make again today, is whether the threshold is set at £4 million, £2 million, or any other level, we are emphatically not saying that it is only contracts above that value that should be considered for community benefit clauses. Uh, this is the threshold at which the duty applies, but it doesn't mean that if public bodies are procuring below that threshold, as many will be doing, that they're not expected to have regard to community benefits. Uh, they absolutely are. And of course, we are already having very significant success in uh, community benefits in our major public contracts. So uh, I think that is uh, the explanation of why we should take time to review this. Uh, and if changes are required, we should make them, but we shouldn't arbitrarily make them at this stage. On Amendment 23, I do recognise the importance of capturing reliable data on the actual achievement of community benefits, uh, but I believe the issue is addressed through other provisions uh, of the Bill. Uh, section 14, subsection 2 of the Bill, as I have no doubt Jackie Bailey will remember, was amended at stage 2. Uh, so annual reports will now include a summary of the community benefits that were fulfilled over the year. Uh, in addition to that, contract award notices for higher value contracts will have to include a statement of what the authority believes the contract will deliver. Uh, so the amendment Jackie Bailey is putting forward, I would argue, is unnecessary given other provisions in the bill. And with the greatest of respect, I would say that is a very rational reason for saying that we shouldn't pass the amendment uh, she's proposing today. So against that background, I would ask Mary Fee to withdraw amendment 41 and uh, Jackie Bailey not to move amendment 23. If these amendments are moved, I would ask the Chamber not to support them. Many thanks. I uh, call on Annabel Ewing, having pressed her request to speak button. I, I pressed it in error. I apologise, Presiding Officer. Right. No problem. Thank you very much. So I now call on Mary Fee to wind up and press or withdraw your amendment, please. Thank you, um, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, and I've listened carefully to the Deputy First Minister's um, comments and while I am pleased to hear her saying that there is a commitment in government to review the thresholds of that would be required for community I mean it would be beneficial if, if the Deputy First Minister could listen to my summing up as I had the courtesy to listen when, when the Deputy First Minister was, was speaking. Um, I do look forward to the review that the Deputy First Minister has said she is committed to to making and perhaps eventually the, the threshold for community benefit will be reduced. However, I would say that it is perhaps unfortunate that that review had not been timed to finish before this bill went through Parliament so that this, this procurement bill could have done something about that threshold to bring benefits to our communities. You would accept that you cannot have minister. a review of a bill before the bill becomes legislation. Uh, the review must follow Parliament enacting the legislation. Maybe I absolutely fee. accept that point. However, while there is an acceptance that um, some stakeholders support the, the view of four million, some don't, the, the Deputy First Minister is committed to keeping that under review. I'm quite sure this, I'm quite sure, no, I'm sorry, I'm quite sure this is not an issue that has just suddenly aris arisen during this consultation. I am sure, no, I'm sorry, that government would already have been aware of the issues around procurement and community benefit. No, sorry, can I just move on? Um, and it, and it, does, it does seem that when the government chooses, they pick and choose what EU regulations they d decide to abide by and not abide by. And I think we need a bit of consistency in the approach that we are taking in relation to EU and regulations. Uh, and I am disappointed in the approach taken, and I will be um, pressing my amendment. Um, and as, as Jackie Bailey said just briefly, Jackie Bailey's amendment is a bit of a, a no-brainer. It's a sound amendment. We need, we need to be able to assess the benefits to know we are doing the right thing. Um, 
And while I accept the words that the Deputy First Minister um, has offered, I am not entirely convinced that we will get the um, outcome and the benefits that we need. Thank you. We will call unusually Nicola Sturgeon, and I will, of course, revert to Mary Fee after that. Nicola Sturgeon. Oh, I think there's two points worth making just for clarity here. Uh, I should point out to Mary Fee that this point has got nothing to do with EU regulations. We've simply set the threshold at the same level as public work contracts, but it's not an issue of compliance with EU regulations. But the other point is this issue about a review. You know, we have a review of legislation after the legislation is enacted and in force. Mary Fee said we should have considered these issues during the legislation. We had a consultation in advance of introducing the bill. That's the normal way in which these things are done. We specifically asked the question about whether respondents thought the threshold was set at the right level, and a clear majority of respondents said, yes, we do think it's set at the right level. So you know, I think this idea that we somehow didn't go through due process simply doesn't uh, withstand scrutiny. The point I'm making here is that we've set a threshold. Uh, we've based that on a clear rationale, but we've built into the legislation the ability to review it against experience and change it by subordinate legislation if that, doesn't, if that seems appropriate. Surely that's a far more orderly and better way of proceeding than simply to pluck a new figure out of thin air that's not been consulted on and stick it into legislation today. And the final word to Mary Fee. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I do struggle um, to understand the logic... The logic... Order! The the logic behind the response from the Deputy First Minister, because the Deputy First Minister said in a response to me that the threshold was based in accordance with guidelines set by the EU. Then she said it had nothing to do with the EU. Yes, she did. Um, and, and I find the confusion, the confusion is, is not helpful. No, I'm sorry. I'm so no. No. It's either in line with the EU or it's not in line with the EU the EU. And perhaps this best demonstrates where we are with procurement. It's some kind of grey area that there is very little clarity around. Thank you. So I take it then that you are pressing your amendment? I am. Thank, Thank you. you. So the amendment, the question is that amendment 41 be agreed to. Are we agreed? No. Right. There will therefore be a division and this will be a, a one minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in amendment number 41 is yes, 44, no, 75. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 23 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with amendment 41. Jackie Bailey, to move or not? Moved. Thank you very much. And so the question is that amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not. There will therefore be a 30 second division. Please vote now.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 23 is yes, 44, no, 71. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 24 in the name of Jackie Bailey, already debated with Amendment 17. Ms Bailey, to move or not? Moved. Thank you very much. So the question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not. There will therefore be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 24 is yes, 44, no, 73. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 42 in the name of Ken McIntosh. Ken McIntosh, to move or not? Move, President Officer. Thank you very much. So the question is that Amendment 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 42, to thunderous applause, is yes, 45, no, 73, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move to Group 10, and I call amendments in the name of Jane Baxter. Group with amendments 4, 5, 25 and 8. Jane Baxter, to move Amendment 1 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As has become increasingly clear over the weeks since Stage 2, there is widespread public concern and condemnation of zero-hours contracts when they are imposed upon employees with no guarantee of minimum hours work or where they are restricted by their contract from seeking other work with which to supplement their income. Recently published research from ACAS highlights the findings that employees on zero-hours contracts are too afraid to search for a new job and feel excluded from the sense of security other full-time workers enjoy. Members will be aware that for many workers, zero-hours contracts often mean people working to earn their poverty, and despite technically being employed, forced to use food, to use food banks just to get by. <coughs> there are some limited circumstances where zero-hours contracts suit both employer and employee, and my amendment seeks to make allowances for such mutually agreeable circumstances. In the main, however, I believe it is important that appropriate provisions are made to ensure that those exploitative employers who wrongly enforce employees into zero-hours contracts are prevented from bidding for public sector contracts. Accordingly, when I moved this amendment at stage two of the bill, I was disappointed that it was not supported by colleagues across the chamber. I note that the Cabinet Secretary indicated at that time that the Scottish Government would be dealing with this matter through workforce-related guidance, but in my view, this does not go far enough, and I'm very keen to see this amendment included in the bill itself. I move Amendment 1 in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Neil Finlay to speak to Amendment 4 and other amendments in the group. Please. Uh, thanks, President Officer. Moving Amendment 4, we know that the Scottish Government, public and local authorities, health authorities, etc., tender a huge amount of public contracts. Therefore, surely it's right that all the companies who procure public contracts pay their fair share of tax, the very tax that pays for the public contracts that they are benefiting from. The organisation Ethical Consumer has recently carried out UK-wide research evaluating the behaviour of 20 major companies who are beneficiaries of public authority contracts. They reported that 14 of these companies were involved in avoiding tax. Of these, many have been recipients of public contracts 
in Scotland. This presiding officer cannot be right, and as a parliament consider in procurement, it is surely correct that we legislate where we can uh, uh, and where we can use the powers that we have to develop policy that ensures the exclusion of those companies who we know to be involved in tax avoidance. A similar point was made in an early day motion at Westminster, uh, lodged in light of the Ethical Consumer Report. The motion called on the UK Government to bring forward a set of legally binding procurement rules that subject companies delivering and bidding for the delivery of public service contracts to high ethical, environmental and anti-tax avoidance stands, uh, standards. This seems to me to be an entirely legitimate aspiration. But, President Officer, it's not just me who agrees with the sentiment of that motion. The SNP at Westminster, no less, also believe that this is a worthy aspiration. In fact, Angus Robertson, the SNP leader at Westminster, and his colleague Mike Weir both signed the motion. Mike Weir indeed was a co-sponsor. So I ask the Scottish Government, are you in agreement with your Westminster colleagues and ready to legislate when you have the power to do so? Or is it the case that you say and do one thing at Westminster where you have no power and do something completely different here when you do have the power to deal with these matters? On Amendment 5, eh, President Officer, I wish to declare an interest as a member of Unite the Union. Can I begin by paying tribute to the outstanding work done on blacklisting by the Scottish Affairs Committee at Westminster under the excellent chairmanship of Ian Davidson MP. I am sure the Cabinet Secretary would want to pay tribute to Mr Davidson's stewardship of that committee and the work that he has done. Uh, their work has exposed the activity of some of the biggest names operating in the UK and Scottish construction industry. Companies like McAlpine, Keir, Skanska, Balfour Beatty, Amy, the Fourth Bridge Constructors Joint Venture and many, many more, all bought into and were up to their necks in a conspiracy against workers whose only crime was to stand up for their workmates by raising concerns about health and safety, site conditions, washing and toilet facilities or wages and rights at work. These companies created, funded and sustained an illegal list of those they saw as undesirables, people banned from working and construction progress projects because they were or were alleged to be trade union political or environmental activists, many victimised for the most spurious of reasons. It was victimisation and it was McCarthyism. But it's not over yet because this was and still is a major human rights abuse and no one has yet been held to account for their actions. Since this was exposed, I have worked closely with colleagues on the Scottish Affairs Committee and with UCAT, the GMB and UNITE to raise the profile of this issue in this Parliament and across Scotland. And I want to welcome members of these unions to the gallery today. It is their campaign that has moved the Government to some limited action in this Bill, and I want to commend them for that. We have come a long way since this issue, this issue was first raised in this Chamber. I do regret that the Cabinet Secretary's offer to meet me earlier on in the process was, was withdrawn. I do not know why that is the case, but that is, of course, her prerogative. I do, however, feel that whilst the Government has gone some way on this, they could go still further and put my amendment on the face of the bill and make it crystal clear to employers what is expected and what will happen if they have blacklisted workers and want to secure future public sector contracts. My amendment will mean there is nowhere for these companies to hide. They will have to own up to what they have done, apologise to the victims and pay adequate compensation nego negotiated by the victims' representatives. And failure to do so is clear there will be no contracts awarded to them. This amendment gives the opportunity for these companies to self-clean, and if they fail to do so, they will in effect be blacklisting themselves. President Officer Siobhan Reardon, the Programme Director at Amnesty International Scotland, says the right to form and join trade unions is a fundamental human right. To discriminate against someone on that basis, including the use of blacklisting, is a violation of that right, and as the bill stands, it does not go far enough. I agree with her. In conclusion, President Officer, 400 Scots were on the Consultant Association's blacklist. I believe that to be the very tip of a large iceberg. We will never know the true extent of this scandal, but I want to pay tribute to the real heroes of this story, not politicians, not trade union leaders, but the ordinary electricians, joiners, steel erectors and scaffolders who are upholding health and safety standards and the principles and values of trade unionism, of looking out for their fellow workers were victimised and, as a result, had their livelihoods taken from them. But they refused to be beaten. And I hope because of their actions and the actions of their trade unions, the construction industry of the future 
will be better than the industry of the past. Thank you much. I now call on the Deputy First Minister to speak to Amendment 25 and other amendments in the group, please. Thanks, Presiding Officer. These are a really important group of amendments because they're dealing with issues that I hope all of us in this chamber will agree are totally unacceptable. Uh, tax avoidance, blacklisting and the inappropriate use of zero hours contracts. Sections 22 and 23 of the Bill allow the Government to make regulations specifying the circumstances in which economic operators should be excluded from competition for public sector contracts. I have already made clear that we intend to make regulations regarding blacklisting. Uh, also, when the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill becomes law, we will also consider what the regulations are able to do to maximise our actions to eliminate tax avoidance. And we will also consider how the guidance on workforce matters that this bill legislates for can help us address zero hours contracts. So uh, the government uh, agrees with many of the comments that have been made by opposition members on these matters and stand firm in our determination to tackle these three issues. Uh, Amendment 25 in my name strengthens the provisions of the bill relating to tax avoidance. Uh, Amendment 25 will make clear that the regulations will address instances where there has been a failure in relation to any matter of tax compliance, whether that's failure to submit a tax return, failure to pay tax on time, and not just a failure to pay tax uh, generally. And I think that amendment is preferable to Amendment 4 in Neil Finlay's name, although, let me be absolutely clear, the objectives behind uh, these two amendments are the same. The Scottish Government will take whatever steps are necessary to ensure that tax avoidance will not succeed in Scotland. Uh, we've made our position consistently clear over a prolonged period of time, and we will continue to do so. Uh, the Government has been equally clear that it is totally opposed to the uh, practice of blacklisting. Uh, Neil Finlay uh, will, I hope, acknowledge the work that the Government has done and will continue to do with the trade unions on this matter. And I would also take the opportunity of welcoming trade union members to the gallery and paying tribute uh, to those workers uh, in many parts of the country and in many uh, different sectors who uh, were victims of the practice of blacklisting, but also who have so bravely worked to bring uh, this practice to light and to help all of us resolve to ensure that we address it uh, for the future. The reason I don't support uh, Amendment 5 is not a, a principled reason, and I would ask Neil Finlay to reflect on this uh, carefully. It, it's a practical reason. Uh, we need the flexibility in this legislation uh, to uh, ensure that we can respond quickly if there are changes to legislation in reserved areas. Uh, changes that I hope very much we will see. For example, and this is a, a specific example, in the context of blacklisting, some trade unions have argued that the 2010 regulations, which are commonly referred to as the blacklisting regulations, need to be strengthened. If that happens, and we are advocates of that happening, then we would need to be able to adapt our approach quickly to bring it into line. And that's why uh, proceeding on the basis of strong, robust regulations that give us that flexibility is preferable to the route that Neil Finlay is proposing. Yes. Neil Finlay. Why, I don't see why the acceptance of my amendment precludes a change in the amendment uh, 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 guidance whenever it needs to be. First it would also require us, uh, depending on the nature of the change that was made to other legislation, to change primary legislation. And as all members are aware, uh, that takes more time to do. So this fulfils the objective. And I, you know, I say this in all sincerity to Neil Finlay. There is not a single uh, shred of light between us in our abhorrence of blacklisting and our determination to do everything we can to tackle it. I want to do it in a way that is effective and also make sure we are able to respond to changes that we are not in control of, but to make sure that at any given time our legislation here in Scotland is as robust as it possibly can be. And I would ask him to reflect uh, on those comments in the spirit that they're offered to him. Um, we'll continue to work uh, with him, with other members, with trade unions to ensure that we are uh, responding as quickly and as effectively as possible. If I can turn uh, briefly to Amendment 1 on zero hours contracts. Again, you know, I think the government has made absolutely clear uh, our uh, our uh, opposition to the inappropriate use of zero hours contracts. So I have no issue at all with the sentiment uh, behind Jane Baxter's Amendment uh, 1. Uh, the issue I have with the drafting of this amendment is just 
a very serious and fundamental question about the practical workability of the amendment. Asking a purchaser, as this amendment would do, to monitor whether or not a bidder employs staff in zero hours contracts, to assess whether or not they signed up to that contract willingly and whether or not they did so following legal or trade union advice is simply not a realistic uh, thing to expect uh, purchasers in every contract to do. I think it would place burdens on purchasers that they couldn't reasonably be expected to discharge, and I don't think that would make for good legislation. That's why the approach that I am proposing to use the guidance in workforce matters provided for by section 24 of the bill uh, to look at what we can do through procurement to tackle the use of zero hours, inappropriate use of zero hours contracts in addition to our other, uh, our other steps in this area is a much better uh, thing to do. And as I've said, in all areas where we've referred to guidance, I am happy to continue to work with members uh, and with the infrastructure committee to look at how we get that right. So I hope across the chamber there will be an understanding and an appreciation that uh, what we are talking about here is not a dispute in any way on the principles of tax avoidance, uh, of blacklisting or of inappropriate use of zero hours contracts. Uh, what I am proposing is that we do this in a way that allows us flexibility, that allows us to make sure our provisions are as effective as possible. And I believe uh, the amendments 25 and 8 in my name uh, do that. And I would ask members to uh, support uh, these amendments uh, over uh, amendments 1, 4 and 5, which I don't think fulfil uh, the same purpose as effectively. Thank you. Now Colin Tavish Scott. Thank you, President. So I just wanted to speak in support of Neil Finlay's uh, amendments in relation to blacklisting, but very much take the sentiment in which the Deputy First Minister has expressed her uh, position on that. Uh, but, and also to uh, clarify Jane Baxter's uh, uh, amendment in relation to zero hours contracts, I totally take the reason way in which she expressed that uh, case uh, fundamentally in terms of ending exploitation uh, of working uh, men and women. Uh, but what uh, I was slightly puzzled by was the contract between Clause 2 and Clause 6 in her drafting in relation to how Clause 6 would work in practice, and if she can shed uh, any light uh, as to uh, the point that that clause makes, which is to give effectively an opt-out in relation to zero hours contract covering legal advice, uh, the advice of trade union, or indeed uh, where an employee agrees to accept a contract that fails to specify guaranteed working hours, that would be enormously helpful in understanding the, the purpose of that amendment. Many thanks. And so I now call on Jane Baxter to wind up and press or withdraw her amendment. Um, whilst I listen to the Cabinet Secretary's response with interest, and I'm pleased that she agreed that these are really important amendments, I'm very disappointed that she's indicated that the Scottish Government will not be supporting this amendment today, and I'm not convinced that practicability is a barrier to taking this forward in, in the context of the, the zero hours contracts. Um, whilst inclusion and guidance is obviously to be welcomed, it does not go far enough in my opinion and I still wish to see my amendment included in the Bill. And similarly, I am disappointed that the Scottish Government will not accept the amendments from my colleague Neil Finlay. I believe this Parliament has a clear responsibility to send out a message to employers that a restrictive, unwieldy and unfair zero-hours contract are not acceptable and that public money should not be used to support them. And I'm grateful to Tavish Scott for asking such a complicated question just shortly before I was due to respond. Um, for the purposes of, of information, Clause 6 says, a contract is not for the purposes of this section a zero-hours contract if, after being given the opportunity to seek legal advice or the advice of a trade union or other elected representative of employees, an employee agrees to accept a contract that fails to specify guaranteed working hours. So I suppose it's at least making sure that if an employee does make that decision, it's an informed decision and it's based on them having accurate information and good advice. And saying that, I'd like to press Amendment 1. Thank you. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will therefore be a division. It will be a one-minute division. Please vote now.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 1 is yes, 39, no, 78. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 4 in the name of Neil Finlay, already debated with Amendment 1. Mr Finlay, to move or not? Move. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will therefore be a division, a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in Amendment No. 4 is yes, 42, no, 75. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. Now call Amendment 5 in the name of Neil Finlay. Mr Finlay, to move or not? Move. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not. There will therefore be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in Amendment No. 5 is yes, 42, no, 74. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 25 in the name of the Deputy First Minister. The Deputy First Minister to move. Moved. Thank you very much. And so the question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. Call Amendment 8 in the name of the Deputy First Minister. Deputy First Minister. Moved. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Thank you very much. Call Amendment 9 in the name of the Deputy First Minister. Deputy First Minister. Moved. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. Now call Amendment 43 in the name of Ken McIntosh. Ken McIntosh, to move. Yes, please move. Thank you very much. So the question is that Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. We are, we are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. Uh, the result of the vote in Amendment No. 43 is yes, 105, no, 12. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore agreed. Call Amendment 10 in the name of the Deputy First Minister. Deputy First Minister. Moved. Thank you. question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you. Call Amendment 26 in the name of Claudia Beamish. Claudia Beamish, to move or not? Not move. Thank you very much. We'll now call Amendment 27 in the name of Claudia Beamish. Uh, Ms. Beamish, to move or not? Not move. Many thanks. And so, we now move to Group 11, and I call Amendment 44 in the name of Patrick Harvey, uh, in a group of its own. Mr Harvey, to move and speak to Amendment 44, please. Thank you. Uh, currently, the, uh, the bill describes the sustainability duty and the community benefit requirements uh, as uh, improving the economic, social and environmental well-being of an authority's area. Later in the bill, it describes that area by reference uh, to um, uh, the, the area by reference to which the 
contracting authority primarily exercises its functions, disregarding any areas outside Scotland. My amendment seeks to remove the words disregarding any areas outside Scotland. This is intended to remove some ambiguity in relation to the uh, permissibility of ethical and fair trade procurement practices. The, the Scottish Fair Trade Forum and Amnesty have both highlighted how this kind of definition could be a, a barrier to considering the global impacts of purchasing decisions. Now, I, I'm aware that there have been some changes to the bill at stage two, and the Scottish Fair Trade Forum have welcomed the um, uh, inclusion of a, a statement uh, of a public authority's general policy on fairly and ethically traded goods. I, I welcome that as well. But a statement of policy is not necessarily the same uh, as a clear commitment to action. And uh, the Fair Trade Forum go on to say that they believe the bill as it stands, uh, that its wording may cause confusion about what is possible to procure and could unintentionally reduce the procurement of ethical and fair trade goods. To give a few examples, the BMA Scotland, in their evidence uh, to the committee, highlighted the estimated 10 million surgical instruments used in the UK each year manufactured in northern Pakistan. They say most of the 50,000 manual labours in the industry are paid less than a dollar a day for a 12-hour day uh, of work. Little job security, serious health and safety risks, uh, as well as uh, contributing to the proliferation of child labour. Other examples include uh, the uh, sexual and physical harassment of, work, uh, of workers, uh, people expected to work uh, over 80 hours a week, uh, illegal working hours, uh, and a ban on unionisation, indicating, I think, that some of the issues Neil Finlay was seeking to raise in his amendment at a, at a domestic level are also global issues, uh, and uh, we should be seeking to address them. Now, obviously, uh, a procuring authority, a contracting authority, may not have access to all of the relevant information about global impacts when it's making a decision. But as far as I can see, the bill actually prohibits uh, them from taking that information into account by saying disregarding any areas outside Scotland. Uh, so this amendment simply seeks to allow uh, those decisions to be fully informed by information about global impacts uh, which is available uh, at the time when decisions are being made. So I move Amendment 44. Many thanks. No other members asked to speak. So I call the Deputy First Minister. Thanks to Patrick Harvey for uh, lodging this amendment. I absolutely agree with him on uh, the importance of recognising and understanding the global impact of procurement. Uh, he's right to point to the fact that we have made changes at stage two, specifically in relation to fair trade. I'm very happy to uh, speak further with the uh, Fair Trade Forum about any concerns that they have, but you know, clearly we were anxious to uh, respond to the issues they raised, but in a way uh, that uh, was appropriate. And I think we've done that in terms of some of the changes that we've made. Uh, there is, uh, before I go on to what I was going to say, I think the point he uh, referred to that the BMA have made, I think is a, a good illustration of the general point he's trying to make. There is nothing in the bill as it currently stands which prevents public bodies from acting in a manner to secure improvements of economic, social and environmental well-being, whatever they may arise. Uh, a point I made at stage two uh, was that specifically the bill as it stands doesn't prevent an authority from taking account of wider global or international issues if it considers that appropriate. But section nine it places a duty on public bodies. And I think it's therefore right that we ensure that the duty we're placing on public bodies strikes the right balance, one that is both proportionate and manageable in a meaningful way at a practical level. And, and that's what section nine, as currently drafted, seeks to do. The amendment that Patrick Harvey eh, is putting forward, my concern about it is the scope is eh, so uh, wide. For example, it, it could lead to challenges against a public body that that public body fail to consider a perceived benefit that might accrue from literally anywhere in the world. And I think 
a duty being placed on a public authority that has a scope quite as wide of that, I think does make it very difficult for public authorities to discharge their duties in a way that they can be reasonably confident does not open them up to legal challenge. Uh, that is not to say I do not think we have an obligation to address the issues that Patrick Harvey has talked about today. I repeat the offer that I made to him at stage two to discuss how we can use the statutory guidance uh, that is going to underpin the sustainable procurement duty uh, to try to encapsulate what are perfectly legitimate points that he's making about the wider implications of procurement exercises. Uh, and I think that's particularly relevant when we're talking about large procurement exercises. Uh, so I would you know, hope he would take me up on uh, that offer. I think he makes legitimate points, but I think uh, the translation of his argument into the specific uh, Amendment 44 that he's put forward today uh, would... Uh, result in legislation that was drafted so widely that it would hinder rather than help public authorities. And I think there is a more effective way that we can try to deliver uh, the ends that he is rightly uh, talking about in the chamber today. Thank you. I have a late bid from Mark Griffin. Very briefly, please. And then I'll ask the Deputy First Minister if she wishes to say anything further. Apologies for being slow with pressing my button, President Officer. As Patrick Harvey mentioned, that this amendment um, removes disregarding any areas outside of Scotland um, from the definition of a contracting authorities area and we don't uh, we won't be supporting the amendment. We feel that the amendment would be too vague to implement in practice and that would make the scope of a contracting authorities area too uncertain. We do agree with the principles and we have tabled amendments round about um, global sustainability taking into account the environment, um, fair trade and other issues. But as I said, I just think that this isn't a practical step and it's a, a burden too far for, for local authorities. Many thanks. Deputy First Minister, do you want to add anything further? In that case, I call Patrick Harvey to wind up and indicate an intention to press or withdraw, please. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm sorry that the government and indeed the uh, uh, Labour Party as well don't seem uh, to be open to this argument. It, it seems to me that the, the central part of uh, the Deputy uh, First Minister's argument against the, uh, the amendment is that it would be very difficult to take account of impacts anywhere in the world. But that surely is what we need to do if we're going to uh, have an approach to sustainability which is global. And that's the, uh, the intention which the Deputy First Minister seems to be agreeing with. Uh, but the, the, the practical reality, of course, will be difficult. Of course it will be challenging, uh, but that's the task at hand. And uh, it, it does seem to me that, uh, that we either need to, to set that challenge to ourselves and to public bodies or, or not. Uh, I would like to press the amendment, but uh, assuming that the uh, government's uh, support is, uh, is as robust as it seems to be today, uh, I'll be happy to have a discussion with the Deputy First Minister after the bill has passed to see if there are other approaches. And I press the amendment. The amendment has been pressed. The question, therefore, is that Amendment 44 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. This is a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 44 is yes, 8, no, 109. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to, which brings us to group 12, which is the final group. And if members are brief, we may be able to keep to the timings as indicated. And I call amendment 28 in the name of Tavi Scott, 
group with Amendment 29 and I ask Tavish Scott to move Amendment 28 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. May I thank James Kelly for giving us an airing at stage uh, two and indeed uh, his own amendment in this uh, group. Amendment, uh, this amendment would ensure that uh, procurement provisions we are agreeing today cover the spending of £1 billion of taxpayers' money. Government created the Scottish Futures Trust, who then in turn created uh, a financial model known as Hubcos, who build, of course, schools and hospitals. Hubcos are managed and led by large private sector businesses, businesses who make profit and charge management fees for building a school or indeed a health centre. But it appears that neither the taxpayer, parliament or audit Scotland know how much profit or what fee is levied. And I would wish to suggest that financial uh, secrecy needs to be replaced with financial transparency that the Deputy First Minister rightly described in her opening speech in introducing this bill to Parliament. Scotland's five hub cores are led by 15 main corporate businesses. Small businesses in Scotland, builders, surveyors, small construction companies, architects, can only hope to be a subcontractor under this arrangement or indeed a subcontractor of a subcontractor. Hub calls, therefore, by definition, exclude thousands of Scottish businesses from tendering for work. And that means that Parliament and indeed Audit Scotland don't know whether we achieve value for money. That, under the Hubco model, is never indeed tested. There is no tender, for example, to build the six schools in the north of Scotland by the Miller-led North Hubco. So again, there is a lack of financial transparency and a belief that economies of scale may deliver better value for money, but we simply don't know. How much profit, for example, will Miller Group make on the building of those six schools? Parliament simply doesn't know. What management fee is Miller Group receiving for this contract? Again, Parliament does not know. Hub calls are not financially accountable, despite the vast amount of public money being spent across Scotland on projects that we, of course, would all wish to see happen. Will hub co businesses be subject to Parliament's policy on the living wage and community benefit that we've just discussed this afternoon? They surely uh, should be. Finally, could I ask Parliament to consider the views of the Federation of Small Businesses, Andy Willocks, who said on this issue, on Hubco's, uh, just this uh, week, I'm astonished the Scottish Government is deliberately excluding so much taxpayer-funded taxpayer buying from the scope of their reforms. We are urging MSPs to look again at the legislation and ask if it is really appropriate for us to turn a blind eye to the purchasing practices of arm-length bodies and Hubco's. Now, the Federation of Small Businesses are supportive of this bill, but they do see this as an area that does need to be addressed. And I would hope that uh, the government, even at this late stage, given their, their very fair uh, observations about the importance of financial accountability, would extend that to this particular group of organisations. Many thanks. James Kelly to speak to Amendment 29. Other amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I rise to support um, Amendments 29 and 28 in this group. The premise of the procurement bill is good procurement practice covering the £10 billion pounds of public contracts. Um, it therefore seems strange that it doesn't cover the issue of Scottish Water. Scottish Water has a £500 million pounds capital expenditure programme uh, and also last year had revenue expenditure of £837 million. Pounds. In relation to the, the capex, there is obviously a contribution to that in terms of the, the government's loan. So this is public money uh, flowing through uh, Scottish water and it is right uh, not only that there's accountability around that but we are able to influence it through the processes in this bill. Similarly the Scottish Futures Trust just as Tavi Scott correctly pinpoints it's a billion pounds of uh, public expenditure you know that that's a, that, that would be an additional uh, tenth of the the money that the bill already covers um, and there are real issues around accountability for how the money is spent and also so, some of the claims made by the Scottish Futures Trust uh, in relation to savings. And it's, there's a weakness that the, in, in relation to these particular amendments, there is a weakness in the bill uh, if these amendments are not included because not only is the expenditure they are then not accountable for, it also means that all the other provisions that we're trying to bring forward in the bill uh, in relation to areas like you know, blacklisting, zero hours contracts, then they, they are not covered by these. So I think it's a real glitch that these are not included and I would urge support for both amendments. 
Very briefly, please, Alex Johnston. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, the failure to include the SFT hub codes in Scottish Water in the list of uh, organisations in the schedule uh, was a surprise to many. Uh, and during the course of the process through committee uh, to this stage today, the questions have been asked and re-asked about why they are not there. Uh, it, the matter has been addressed to some extent in the letter which was written uh, by the, dip, the Deputy Presiding Officer to Maureen Watt, Convener of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee, in which she points out that, uh, by agreement, Scottish Water will abide uh, roughly by the rules uh, that exist here and that the SFTs have agreed to do some, uh, or the hubcos have agreed to do something similar. That therefore begs the question, why are they not included uh, on the list of organisations that will be covered? I think the question has been asked repeatedly. It's never been answered to my satisfaction. And for that reason, I will support the amendments today. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call the Deputy First Minister. Um, I think it would be helpful, uh, no doubt to the Chamber, to explain, uh, as I have done at previous uh, stages of this bill, why Hubco's and Scottish Water are not included within its ambit. Uh, Hubco's, first of all, I, I should say just as an observation to Tavish Scott, although I'm sure he will correct me if my recollection is wrong here, but I actually uh, seem to recall that the concept of Hubco's was first developed by the previous administration and taken forward by this administration. Uh, but hubcos are not public bodies. They are institutionalised private public bodies. Their private partners are procured after open competitive uh, processes. Uh, Scottish Water is publicly owned, uh, but Scottish Water is subject to a very different regime of EU legislation. And the bill, the regulations uh, and the guidance have been drafted uh, and, and will be drafted to dovetail with EU public procurement rules. Indeed, the bill currently does this in relation to uh, Scottish Order, as would relate to Scottish Water, by excluding utilities contracts, which is consistent with the existing EU procurement law approach, uh, because they're subject to a separate legal regime. Applying the bill to a body that's subject to a different EU law framework would create uh, complexity, considerable complexity. I think it would create some risk for all concerned as it would require work with two very different EU legal regimes. Um, that said, at stage two, I undertook uh, to write to the committee after further dialogue with both the Scottish Futures Trust and Scottish Water, which I did on 6 May. I sent that letter to the committee. Uh, the letter makes clear that SFT intends to work with Hubcos uh, to encourage them to adopt the good practice in the bill uh, where that is appropriate. Indeed, uh, I should point out to the Chamber that that is already happening in a number of areas, community benefit clauses being one example of that. And with regard to, uh, yes, if I've got time. Uh, sorry. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. She'll be aware from correspondence that we've had in relation to the point that Tavish Scott was making uh, about the involvement of um, smaller firms within uh, constituencies that he and I, uh, others in this Parliament, represent, uh, that the notion of Scottish Water using uh, regional re uh, rural frameworks might be a way of getting around this, having the transparency that both James Kelly and Tavish Scott were referring to, but allowing more of an involvement of, uh, of companies and the multiplier effect that that brings to, to our local economies to be uh, achieved. Well, I'm more than happy to discuss the issue relating to Scottish Water, uh, Scottish Water with the member if you would find that helpful. Uh, if I'm understanding his point correctly, I, I would point out that there's nothing in the bill that prevents the use of framework contracts. So I'm not sure that you know, his point necessarily uh, hangs together in that respect. But if I've misunderstood him, I'm more than happy to engage further uh, with him. I was pointing out that in relation to SFT and, and, and hub cos, uh, number of areas covered by this bill already uh, are in use, community benefit clauses being the example uh, that I would cite. With regard to Scottish Water, it has also provided an assurance that it supports the general principles of the bill and will continue to adhere to its key components. And again, I would highlight that Scottish Water already uh, does uh, adhere to many of the key components of this bill. It advertises via the Public Contract Scotland website. It uses standard pre-qualification questionnaires. It uses community benefit clauses in its major contracts. These are all issues that the bill addresses that Scottish Water is already adhering to, even although it's not part of the uh, overall framework of the bill. So uh, I would ask uh, Tavish Scott to withdraw Amendment 28, uh, James Kelly not to move Amendment 29, um, and to ask the Chamber not to support either of these amendments. 
Thank you very much. I call Tavish Scott to wind up and indicate an intention to press a withdrawal, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I take the uh, Deputy First Minister's uh, remarks in relation to the, some of the provisions of the Bill which do, as she has just described, apply to some of these bodies, uh, and uh, that is progress. Uh, but what I thought was interesting is the Deputy First Minister did not uh, respond to the major concern that I think many of us have, and that is financial accountability to this Parliament. Uh, we do, I, I would hate to repeat all the same points, but we do not know um, because of the structure of these hub codes. And I'm not saying this structure was right whenever it was, I take a point about when it was introduced, I don't, whenever it was introduced it was right. Uh, we do not know how that can deliver value for money. We don't know when schools are, uh, are um, put into the programme that we achieve value for money because there isn't a tender at that, uh, at that uh, stage. And that seems to me uh, in the government's interest to, to seek to do that. And therefore, if the hub core model isn't achieving that, then perhaps that should be uh, considered from, from first uh, principles. But I think for many of the reasons that James Kelly and Alec Johnson and others have expressed, there does appear to me to be a fundamental point that a billion pounds of public spending should be included in the provisions of this bill. And that's one we should support. Many thanks. Members will note that we've passed the agreed time limit for the debate on this group to finish, and I exercised my power under Rule 9.8.4 AC to allow the debate on the group to continue beyond the limit in order to avoid the debate being unreasonably curtailed. But the question now is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all... 28, yeah. Sorry. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. This will be a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 28 is yes, 56, no, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. And I now call amendment 29 in the name of James Kelly, already debated with amendment 28, and to ask James Kelly to move or not move. Move. The member has moved. The question therefore is that amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The parliament is not agreed. There will be a 30 second division. Please vote now. Order. The result of the vote on amendment number 29 is yes, 56, no, 61. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to, and that ends consideration of amendments. Can I ask members leaving the chamber to do so as quickly and quietly as possible, please? The next item of business is a debate on motion number 10005 in the name of Nicola Sturgeon on the Procurement Reform Scotland Bill. Members who wish to participate in this debate should press the request to speak buttons now, and I notify the Chamber that we are tight for time. I therefore call on Nicola Sturgeon to speak to and move the motion. Deputy First Minister, if you could do so in around eight minutes, I'd be most grateful. Uh, 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin uh, this debate by thanking all those who have contributed to the development of this bill. I want to thank members from across the chamber, uh, a range of stakeholders. Stakeholders uh, with a, an interest in procurement from various different perspectives have contributed hugely to our procurement reform agenda and I know will continue to do so and I'm very grateful to them. I also want to thank the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee whose scrutiny of the bill I think has led to a significant number of improvements. Uh, and lastly, if I can place on record my thanks to my own officials and bill team who have worked uh, very hard on what uh, is at times a very technical and very complex area of law. I think it's fair to say that as the bill has progressed through the parliamentary process, it has stimulated some uh, very passionate and lively uh, discussion. I think that's a good thing. Uh, what I want to do in these remarks, though, is focus on what I believe is a remarkable degree of consensus about what our ambitions should be in relation to public procurement. I think all of us across party divides support the broad aims of the bill, which are to ensure that the £10 billion every year that the public spe sector spends in Scotland is spent wisely and it's spent fairly, and to ensure that we use that spending wherever we possibly can to generate additional benefits for our communities, for our businesses and for our citizens and indeed for uh, the wider world, which is something that Patrick Harvey uh, sought to highlight in some of his own amendments. The bill contains a strong statement of intent that good procurement practice must mean thinking about the bigger picture when planning a procurement exercise. The new general duties in the bill will help achieve that and the greater transparency that the requirements on advertising, contract registers and published strategies will deliver will help us understand how procurement is performing and what it is delivering or not delivering and enable us to take action if the latter is the case. Jackie Bailey's amendment, uh, which was agreed uh, today, will include national reports to Parliament and that will help uh, us to ensure that we're able to monitor performance and strive for ever greater results. As we debate the bill, I think it's important that we remember, though, that procurement must continue to deliver value for the taxpayer. The Scottish model of procurement, as it's increasingly uh, been recognised, has at its heart the need to strike the best balance of cost, quality and sustainability. Delivering savings, reducing waste, improving quality through innovation are all vitally important objectives for our public services and are at the heart of what professional procurement staff are employed to deliver. Uh, the bill needs to help them perform that important role not hinder them in doing it. We've also got to remember that public bodies, uh, the public bodies that were asking to embrace the requirements in the bill already have a complex and demanding set of rules that they must comply with in relation to the overarching European law and procurement. So in framing the bill, we've had to work hard. And I know this hasn't always been popular when I've used this explanation to keep the new rules as simple and as easy to understand as we can and to keep them compliant with EU law. Perhaps uh, it is a sign, or perhaps it's just a sign that I am uh, an eternal optimist, but I'm going to take it as a sign that we've managed to strike a reasonable balance in this bill uh, by the fact that there are some stakeholders who think the bill doesn't go far enough, and there are an equal number of stakeholders who think it goes far too far. So that perhaps uh, is a sign that we've struck a balance. Uh, I believe we all share the ambition that public procurement in Scotland should be business friendly through standardising processes, streamlining bureaucracy and encouraging innovation. Uh, I think the business friendly aspects of this bill are particularly important uh, when it comes to small businesses, third sector organisations and supported uh, businesses. And I want to make sure that this bill does deliver real improvements for them in terms of their ability to access public contracts. I believe we also all want companies bidding for public uh, contracts to conduct their business in an ethical manner. Uh, I certainly want it to be the case that only businesses that comply with their obligations in law are successful in winning public contracts in providing the power to make regulations and issue guidance on the selection of bidders and the exclusion of companies from the procurement exercises, the bill will address these issues and it will help us to ensure that only reputable companies win public contracts. And I want to ensure Parliament today that addressing issues like the living wage, blacklisting, inappropriate use of zero hours contracts uh, and uh, issues to do with promoting equality generally uh, will all be central to how we frame the regulations and the guidance that will underpin this legislation. So I uh, firmly believe that this bill will establish a national legislative framework for public procurement that is both 
business friendly and socially responsible. And it is not always easy. I uh, remember saying in the debate at stage one of this bill that there are tensions running through this whole agenda that can often feel very difficult to reconcile, but reconcile them we must. It is important to emphasise both sides of the equation, business friendly and socially responsible, uh, so that we strike an appropriate balance. And I believe the bill does this, uh, but the regulations and the guidance will, of course, uh, be crucial to ensuring that we continue to get that right. And I mentioned stakeholders at the outset. The contribution of stakeholders in the next stages of this process will be extremely important in making sure both of the commitments I've given during the process about reflecting particular priorities and guidance uh, are delivered and that we do that in a meaningful and robust uh, way. Uh, we've had a huge number of responses, over 250, uh, as we've gone through uh, the consultation on this bill, uh, and we need to harness all of that expertise as we go into the next stage. Um, I think we have, uh, or will when we pass it uh, later on, as I hope we will, uh, have delivered a piece of legislation that can make a big contribution to improving procurement performance, and importantly, uh, that will deliver these improvements without imp imposing unnecessary or disproportionate burdens or indeed opening our public bodies to substantial uh, legal uh, risk. Uh, on this occasion, as I've already alluded to, given that much of the bill is couched in terms of enabling powers and very deliberately so, uh, stage three will uh, feel perhaps more like uh, the start of a process rather than the end of a process. As we work through the various pieces of uh, led, uh, regulation and guidance that the bill provides for, it will be important that we continue to engage comprehensively with all stakeholders. As I've said, I've also given a number of commitments to partnership and cross-party working, uh, and I'm happy to restate that the government will continue to approach all of its work on procurement reform in a fully inclusive manner. Um, I think this bill is a good piece of legislation that will make a difference. But one of the other points that was made at an earlier stage of this bill is that legislation is but one part of our procurement reform agenda. It was never going to be the case that we could resolve all of the ills around procurement or some of the wider social and economic issues that we have touched upon in relation to this bill through this one piece of legislation. I think we've done a good job in giving ourselves the tools to do so, but our wider programme of procurement reform uh, continues to be very uh, important. I think Scotland is rightly gaining uh, a good international reputation for its uh, record and its work on public procurement. I think this bill will contribute to that, uh, but the work that comes after it in terms of the guidance and regulations and in our wider agenda will ensure that we continue to move forward to get better at it so that that £10 billion we spend every year is spent well and in a way that delivers benefits right across our society. Many thanks, and I'm grateful to Deputy First Minister for curtailing her speech. However, I do have to notify backbench members that if I'm to call everyone, I will have to give speeches of three and a half minutes. I now call on James Kelly, maximum seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to take part in the Stage 3 open debate on the Procurement Reform Scotland Bill. Um, and I would indicate that the Labour Party are supporting the uh, bill at stage three when the division comes round at quarter past six. Um, I do agree with Nicola Sturgeon in the sense in that the £10 billion of public sector spend that is available to influence through this bill uh, is, a, is an opportunity, um, not only for good procurement practice, but in order to implement you know, more fairness in our communities throughout Scotland. However, in that regard, I think the bill, although we are supporting it, uh, is a missed opportunity. Uh, Labour interacted seriously with, the, with this bill throughout. Uh, we submitted a, a suite of amendments at stage two, all of which, with the exception of one, were uh, rejected by the government. Uh, and although we've seen uh, some progress this afternoon in terms of a, a, a number of a, uh, amendments from Jackie Bailey and ones from Ken McIntosh. I think if you actually examined the bill that was initially published and look at the final version that we're going to vote on shortly, there's actually very little difference in it. Um, and for such an important bill, an important piece of legislation, um, it does make you wonder as to you know, how good the parliamentary process has been uh, during the course of consideration of these uh, stages. 
Um, in terms of the living wage, I'm not going to rerun the, the arguments that we've had. I'm sure people will be delighted to know. Uh, what I would say is that uh, you know, I'm obviously disappointed that the Labour uh, amendment uh, hasn't been included. I did genuinely believe it was a real opportunity to extend the living wage. Um, in terms of the SNP amendment, I think, I think that is a result of the pressure from campaigning groups such as the STUC, SCVO, uh, uh, and others. Uh, you know, and I think that has moved the SNP to include provision for the uh, living wage uh, in the bill. As I said earlier, um, uh, I'm not convinced that that's strong enough, and I, I remain convinced as to how much difference that will make. I think in terms of moving the living wage forward, um, what I'll be really interested in is monitoring the impact of this bill and the changes that uh, Nicola Sturgeon uh, announced earlier. I think it might be useful if there was uh, a living wage unit in order to do that, because we want to see whether the effect uh, of these changes does result in more people uh, being paid at the living wage. I think there also remains uh, a big issue, as I've consistently raised in recent weeks uh, in relation to Scottish go people working on Scottish government contracts uh, in prisons. You know, we had the example a couple of weeks ago of the National Museum of Scotland shop who are not paid uh, the living wage. Uh, and if, you know, if the, the amendments that Nicola Sturgeon has brought forward, if she's to match her uh, rhetoric uh, with implementation, then we've got to see some movement for those uh, workers. I think what is also needed moving forward is a national living wage strategy. Uh, one of the interesting things in recent weeks is we've seen more businesses come out for the living wage, KPMG nationwide. I think the there is an opportunity to extend the payment of it, not just in the public sector, but in the private sector um, throughout Scotland. In terms of some of the other uh, issues, um, you know, I regret that uh, the provisions of the bill on community benefit will not uh, strengthen to cover more uh, contracts in terms of the threshold being reduced. Uh, I also would have preferred to see that the, 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 the amendment wasn't selected for inclusion, but I would also have uh, liked to have seen uh, inclusion of community benefit in relation to apprentices. Uh, you know, that could have been a real opportunity. I think in terms of, you know, aggressive tax avoidance, uh, I think we could have been stronger on that. You know, I think if, if people are adopting practices of aggressive tax avoidance and they're then taking money from the public purse, uh, that's something that we should have more control over. I do welcome the movement that there was on trade union recognition uh, in terms of Ken McIntosh's amendment uh, and also on Jackie Bailey's amendment on annual reporting. I think annual reporting and monitoring is important going forward on this bill um, because we, we can then see uh, the effect of the, you know, the, the 10 billion pounds uh, and the effect of some of the changes that have been put forward. Uh, however, that wasn't matched by, you know, support for changes on, you know, blacklisting, zero hours contracts, supported businesses. I also think Jackie Bailey's point about a, an equal pay uh, audit you know, was a, was a very po important one, you know, particularly when you see that if you look at the living wage, 64% uh, of the people not on the living wage uh, are women. That's 256,000. So that shows, as Jackie Bailey said in a contribution, that there's uh, still a long way to, to go. Um, I think uh, the, you know, another issue that I would agree with Nicola Sturgeon on is that it's not just about this bill, it's about the processes around procurement. Um, and I think one of the issues that businesses you know, bring to all MSPs is there's a, a frustration around the process. They feel it's too complicated uh, and it needs to be simplified. So it's not just a case of legislation. It needs to be a simpl simplification uh, of, the, of, of the process. So uh, in summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, we will be supporting the bill at stage three. We have atten attempted seriously to bring forward uh, robust amendments that I think would have made the bill stronger and would have made the procurement process stronger. Uh, I'll be very interested going forward to see how this bill plays out and what impact it has on that £10 billion of spend. Uh, and I look forward to examining that in Parliament and throughout the country.
Many thanks. I now call on Alex Johnson. Maximum five minutes. Less would be better. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I rise to support this bill. I think we've come to a position where we have something that we can all uh, agree on. Of course, if I had been doing this myself, if I'd ever had the chance to be the Cabinet Secretary, I might have done something very different. Uh, however, my additional chapter on compulsory competitive tendering remains in the desk drawer where it may stay for some time. However, the priorities in getting this bill uh, through Parliament and onto the statute book was to make sure that we had a procurement system which was simple to understand, easy to access, maximise the opportunities and minimise the burdens on those companies uh, who bid for contracts. And always in my mind, although we've been talking about big companies in many cases, I've had small businesses. My concern has always been that small businesses often miss the opportunity uh, to participate in government contracts. And if we can deliver that, then we'll have done something very worthwhile. It is the case also that during the process we've uh, seen the government introduce some changes that will uh, strengthen the position of the third sector uh, and will do something to, for supported businesses too. These are two groups which uh, in initial evidence the committee felt that they had been disadvantaged by processes in the past uh, and I hope that they feel that their position has been strengthened to some extent. There is a significant uh, case to be said that this bill will require fine-tuning through regulation uh, and indeed the Minister has made it clear that the nature of the bill will allow that to happen as the process goes on. As we've uh, gone through this, both at stage two and at stage three, the Labour Party have tried particularly hard to introduce a series of other issues that, in my view, take the, would have taken the bill beyond the issue of procurement. Uh, I wish to almost take this opportunity to apologise uh, for the fact that I've voted against all their proposals. The reason for that is that I want this bill to be about procurement and I want it to be simple and easy to understand. While I don't agree with all the principles that the Labour Party brought forward, I think it is essential that for the good of Scotland as we go forward that these issues are all addressed and I hope the Labour Party will find opportunities to bring them to the Chamber and force them onto the political agenda so that we can discuss them in that environment. I don't believe that the procurement bill was the place to have that argument. For that reason, I think we have a, a piece of legislation which is fit for purpose, uh, will find supporters and detractors among those who are likely to take advantage of it, uh, will, at the end of the day, deliver a framework upon which we can build over time, and I hope genuinely that it will deliver efficient use of public money and fair distribution of contracts across Scotland's many businesses, supported businesses and third sector organisations. If we can look back and believe that we've achieved that, I think we'll have a great deal to be proud of. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate and we are very tight for time, maximum three and a half minutes. Jimmy, did to be followed by you, Henry. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to take part in this stage three debate and I would like to begin by paying tribute to all of those individuals and stakeholders who have contributed to the process of scrutinising and strengthening the provisions of the bill. I believe that the bill at stage three is a better bill than the one which was first published. On the issue of fair trade and ethical practice, I argued at stage two with the support of the Scottish Fair Trade Forum for measures to strengthen the bill. I was therefore pleased that the government responded by tabling an amendment to include a statement of a public authority's general policy on fairly and ethically traded goods and services as part of its procurement strategy. In the words of the Scottish Fair Trade Forum, this will help build on the significant progress Scotland has already made as a fair trade nation. The bill, as amended at stage two, will for the first time compel public authorities to state their policy towards ethical and fair trade. And I very much welcome that and I am pleased to have had the opportunity to work alongside the Scottish Fair Trade Forum to make that possible. I was also pleased that the amendment tabled by me this afternoon, which seeks to promote compliance by contractors and subcontractors with the provisions of health and safety legislation, has now been incorporated into the bill. 
And I put on record again my thanks to the Scottish Hazards Campaign Group and Families Against Corporate Killers for highlighting this issue. On blacklisting, the Government has made it clear throughout the passage of the Bill that it is totally opposed to the unacceptable practice of blacklisting. The Government has worked closely with the trade unions to develop comprehensive guidance which will require companies seeking public sector contracts to disclose whether they have been involved in blacklisting. This guidance includes a new standard pre-qualification questionnaire requiring supply to disclose if they have breached laws to outlaw blacklisting. No one should doubt the Deputy First Minister's commitment on this issue. Asked by me at the Committee on the 11th of December if the Government had gone as far as it is possible to go, she stated anything that we can do to banish blacklisting will be done. And I'm pleased that the Government has um, followed through on this commitment uh, this afternoon in outlining how this can be done most effectively. The government's approach was also welcomed by Families Against Corporate Killers, who stated, we have also been heartened by the recent announcement on the exclusion from public sector contracts of companies which engage in blacklisting, particularly because so many of those blacklisted have been so because of their health and safety activities. Final now, minute. So, sorry, sorry final officer. minute. Uh, there has been much discussion uh, this afternoon on the living wage. James Kelly um, said that the bill had not changed substantially since stage one and then proceeded to say that the amendment on a living wage was as a result of pressure from the STUC and others. The government's amendment, uh, which was passed today, puts an, um, places an explicit reference to the living wage on the face of the bill, and I think whatever differences we have, we should welcome that. The Scottish Government is doing all that it can with the powers it currently has to address the issue of low pay and the amendments passed this afternoon will mean that businesses wanting to work on public sector contracts will have to clearly demonstrate how they plan to remunerate their staff. Presiding officer, the test which must be applied to this bill is whether or not it will make a difference. Will it improve the pay and working conditions of people employed across Scotland? Does it drive economic activity across the supply chain? Can it strengthen the position of small businesses and the third sector? And does it promote fairness in employment and fair trade practices? I believe in all of these crucial tests the bill has succeeded and for those reasons it deserves to pass at stage three tonight. Thank you, Hugh Henry. To be followed by Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. We shouldn't underestimate just the, the, the power, the sheer scale of what the, the public sector can do uh, by using its purchasing power. The public sector affects every aspect of life in Scotland. And because of the significance of the public sector, then it has the opportunity to make a difference. And one of the, 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 the problems, I think, over the years is that we have underestimated how we can use procurement as a force for positive change. Now, Alec Johnson said that he didn't support uh, much of what the Labour Party had been attempting to do because he didn't see the significance or relevance of that to procurement. But in fact, as, if Jim Eady is right in saying that you can use procurement to affect changes in relation to health and safety, then you can use procurement to affect changes in a whole raft of, of things across the public sector. Now, both the Cabinet Secretary, Jim Eady, and, 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 you know, has made reference to the fact that we have moved forward um, in relation to what the government has put in the face of the bill uh, with respect to the living wage. And I think there's a number of positive changes um, that have been made. I think there is a genuine uh, acceptance that procurement can make a difference and that we should be using uh, our powers in this parliament to, 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 to improve things. But nor should we actually underestimate what we can do. And it's disappointing that we have just pulled back um, you know, from using those powers uh, to the full. Now, it's all very well to say that there will be a reference to the living wage uh, on the bill, but we actually could have gone much further. Now, whether guidance does anything uh, remains to be seen, and I hope it does. But we could have gone much further in specifying a legal requirement on the bill that forces the Scottish Government to say to its contractors and subcontractors, one of the conditions for you getting this contract is that you will pay the living wage. Now, that may well have a financial consequence, but that would be a matter for the Scottish Government to ensure that that price is paid in the contract to ensure that it happens. Because there is a, a good example of that happening already, the example of Renfrewshire Council. Renfrewshire Council, as, in response to the, the Unison uh, care campaign, 
has specified that the contractors for care must pay the living wage. Final there, is a, there is a cost to the council for that. But the, yes, certainly. Deputy First Minister. I just wonder if you would concede that at no point during this bill have I used a financial argument against the having a mandatory requirement for the living wage. It's entirely been a legal point. I agree with them we should use this procurement bill to the maximum to promote the living wage. So it's never been a financial argument that he's heard from me. Hugh Henry, 30 seconds. But the fact is that using that financial clout could have been underpinned legally, as Renfrewshire Council is doing, to make sure that not just the Scottish Government, but every public sector provider does the same. You could do it because it is being done. And it's a shame that councils like Renfrewshire are being left on their own to do it. We should have the full force of the public sector lined up in support of that initiative. So, yes, let's support the bill. Positive changes, but we actually could have done much more. Many thanks. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. We are short of time and how much we can all say. But one thing I would say in response to Hugh Henry is um, I haven't seen an awful lot of councils, uh, Labour or otherwise, running forward to push for this. And in fact, when you do the investigation, quite often um, some of the procurement they carry out, no, I don't have time, leaves a lot to, to be desired. And I'm not convinced, um, having looked at all the work that has been done through this, that we could in fact put that in the face of the bill and I'm really pleased with what the Cabinet Secretary has brought forward because she's absolutely right. Public procurement already has a complex and demanding set of rules. I do think there's a balance that has been achieved uh, in this procurement bill and it has been a long time coming since um, the Cabinet Secretary's own government came in in 2007 and started to revise procurement started to make it better, started to streamline it, uh, try and cut down on the bureaucracy. And what I think is absolutely wonderful is to have that two-pronged approach, which is business-friendly but socially responsible. That is extremely, extremely important. And legislation is only one part of the reform agenda, and I'm glad to hear that we can look forward to more coming forward to try and achieve these aims. And one of the things that, that I believe is both business friendly and socially responsible is to put an emphasis on small and medium sized enterprises when we are looking at public procurement in a, a country like Scotland, where we have um, defined localities, defined areas, where we have local authorities doing a lot of public procurement. I think that well being and the the support that comes for small and medium enterprises and well-being of communities can be combined. And I know it's difficult because we do operate under uh, procurement rules of Europe. Uh, it's very, very hard, but there are innovative ways of managing that kind of thing. I mean, after all, um, in Scotland, small and medium enterprises account for over 99% of enterprises, over 53% of employment and 36.5% of turnover. It is so minute. very, very important. I know there's been a lot of discussion um, going on about the possibility of breaking contracts into smaller lots to uh, be able to, to take best advantage of small and medium enterprises. And I know that um, the directives will have to be looked at very, very carefully to allow this kind of thing to happen. But I think that's where we're right in having a fairly straightforward bill, procurement bill in legislation that then allows you to look very carefully at future directives and to transpose them for best possible advantage. Now, in East Kilbride, um, where I represent, this is extremely important. There is a task force set up by South Lanarkshire Council. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to go along to their meetings because they seem to have some problem about whether I can keep things commercially confidential. But Begin to uh, draw to a close, please. that's an argument I'll have with them. I hope they take this on board. I hope South Lanarkshire Council, in looking at East Kilbride, will look at the importance of small and medium enterprises. And I think that's something that could be done in communities across Scotland for the well-being of that community and their economic success. Thank you very much. I intend to call the remaining two members. Tavish Scott to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Three minutes each, please. I'm with Jamiri. I'm going to, uh, to apply the does the bill make a difference uh, test. I think he's quite right about that. For this reason, some years ago, um, a very uh, bright and impressive school cook on the island I live on, where my children went to school, uh, 
tried to introduce uh, local lamb onto the school menu. And she went through hoops and hoops and hoops to overcome local government uh, procurement. And to this day in Shetland, and I'm going to use this bill hopefully to uh, encourage Shetland Lands Council to do a heck of a lot better on this, uh, it, it, the um, sourcing of local beef and lamb and fish indeed uh, for local uh, schools and, other, and care centres and other public sector um, uh, public sector provision uh, is not uh, done at that local level. Uh, and I hope, to, using the community benefit uh, regime that the government have introduced and others have, and all parties have very much supported uh, through the passage of this bill here uh, today, that that and other measures that are in this bill uh, will assist our local councils and indeed other public sector providers to uh, ensure that provision can help the local economy in that kind of way, uh, in that case uh, local agriculture, in that kind of way, uh, which would be beneficial, I would have thought, for so uh, many reasons, not least of which on the food miles arguments and many of these other ones that we make uh, in a different context. So I do uh, hope this bill is a considerable uh, step forward. I'd like to thank the Deputy First Minister for taking it forward in the spirit in which she's done. I particularly look forward to Jackie Bailey's uh, annual report now being used. Um, so I, she'll forgive me if, if, uh, if uh, I hope that hub calls come under a degree of more scrutiny than uh, they have in the past. And if that's a mechanism that the government have supported today, then I applaud that. I think that is a good step uh, forward. The two other aspects that I uh, did want to highlight were firstly the access, as Linda Fabiani has rightly been pointed to, uh, for contracts for our small uh, business uh, sector. I don't think we, uh, that any government has gone far enough in this area yet. And these big framework documents, these big structures that are now in place in terms of procurement across Scotland, uh, I think are tricky, to put it mildly, for uh, smaller businesses across Scotland of all kinds. Construction, uh, white collar, blue collar, uh, 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 professional bodies, uh, professional businesses, for example, providing architectural services. And I'm sure the Deputy First Minister has been on the end of numerous representations on this and I do hope that her government is able to make a big step forward using the measures that we are going to pass uh, today. But the final point is just to observe that uh, when we do pass legislation like this and when much of it as the Deputy First Minister um, illustrated in her opening remarks uh, will depend on the secondary legislation that's subsequently um, considered by Parliament, uh, there is a job for all of us to do on that because I suspect that is where we genuinely can make a difference to the kind of issues that many members have raised this afternoon. Many Thanks. And finally, Jackie Bailey, three minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I dispense with the normal thanks that are customary in the interests of time? But thank you. You know who you are. Um, at the heart of this bill, it is very much about improving procurement in the public sector and getting the maximum advantage from expenditure of some £10 billion each year. But it is, for me and for others in the Chamber, much more than that. It's about how we use that substantial amount of money and the influence of the public sector to drive change. Change in the standard and quality of services change in the rights of those who are employed to deliver that service. How staff are valued and treated matters. So the living wage, equal pay audits, public sector equality duties, all should be on the face of the bill, not just in guidance. The one thing I did learn from my time as a minister is that what you put on the face of the bill is what matters to you and your government. That is a political choice, and I'm disappointed that the Cabinet Secretary does not believe that these areas are of sufficient importance to include on the face of the bill. Let me touch on equality and the equal pay gap, because the Deputy First Minister, in rejecting equal pay audits, couldn't help herself. She departed to the usual attack on Westminster. So let me ask the Chamber, how many times is equal pay, gender pay gaps, or the pay gap itself mentioned in the body of the white paper? Is it once? Is it twice? Is it even three times? Well, let me tell the Chamber, it's not mentioned at all. You need to go to Annex D on page 607 to get a mention of wage equality. Now, that tells you all you need to know about the SNP's priorities. Women included as an annex, simply an afterthought. And let me turn to the living wage, because the Cabinet Secretary has portfolio responsibility for tackling child poverty, and she would agree that report after report is unanimous about the scale of the problem and what we need to do to begin to tackle it. The majority of these reports say that there is much the Scottish Government can do now, including implementing the living wage. You only need to look at the sharp increase in in-work poverty and the increase in queues at food banks to know the importance of making work pay. And as James Kelly has already said, this has a greater impact on women who are 64% of the 400,000 workers that would benefit. The Cabinet Secretary knows 
that women are more generally employed in low-paid jobs. Many work part-time. This bill could have made a huge difference to them. It could have been so much bolder on the living wage, on equal pay, on the public sector equality duty and improving women's lives. You know, this isn't a bad bill and I welcome her agreement to a number of amendments from across the chamber, but I do think it is a missed opportunity. In advance of the referendum, the SNP has discovered women, and I welcome that newfound interest. And I'm always delighted to see more women in the Cabinet, but it's no substitute for taking practical action to improve hundreds and thousands of women's lives right now. Many thanks. And I now call on Gavin Brown in the closing speeches. Four minutes maximum, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I want to make uh, two points in closing for the Scottish Conservatives today. The first one is that we broadly support the approach taken by the government towards the bill as a whole and also to the amendments both at stage two and stage three today. Because while there were a number of powerful arguments put forward by the Labour Party, by the Green Party and indeed by the Liberal Democrats about amendments that they wanted to see, had we passed all of those amendments, I think there would have been a negative consequence to business across Scotland. Had we put additional requirements for the living wage and sustainability and animal welfare and reducing inequality and climate change and the third sector and wage ratios, equalities, zero hours, equal pay, tax avoidance and blacklisting all in one go, then I think there would have been a significant risk that many businesses would have increased their costs and the £10 billion pounds of procurement that have been mentioned by all parties would not have gone nearly as far as we all want it to go. And in particular, I think we would have seen even fewer small and micro businesses engaging with the public sector and even attempting to win public sector contracts. I think there is broad agreement across the chamber that there are not enough SMEs doing business with the public sector. I think there's broad agreement that everybody wants to see them getting a larger slice of the pie and doing more business. But had we implemented all that everyone wanted to happen today, the process would not have been simplified. It would have been made more complex. And I think in the absence of a formal impact assessment, we may well have lived to regret making all of those decisions. The second part I want to focus on, and this is a plea to the Cabinet Secretary, because she's right when she said that this is not the end of the process. In some ways, it is the beginning. But one particular issue that I hope can be taken forward by the government when it comes to guidance and regulation is in an area that Linda Fabiani touched on in her speech, and that's the size of contracts. Because the most common complaint from small businesses is that they are precluded, not officially, not legally, from getting involved, but they're precluded because the size of the contract is simply too large for the business that they currently have. It's an issue for businesses in almost every constituency in Scotland. And the key question to answer is how can we unbundle more of those contracts so that small businesses have a fighting chance? They don't want uh, special treatment. They just want the ability to compete against the bigger players and the opportunity to win more business ultimately. Final FSP minute. Scotland, I think, in their briefing uh, for the stage three debate, put it well that they think the statutory guidance on procurement strategies and annual reports will be vital to ensure that we get smaller lots and better small business access. Now, section nine of the bill, as uh, hopefully will be passed, does talk about facilitating the involvement of small and medium enterprises, but my plea to the Scottish Government is to go a step further. In section 9A, guidance can be published on that specific point, and I ask them to think carefully about that in the coming months so that we can get formal guidance that does unbundle uh, the size of contracts and give smaller businesses the opportunity to compete. I'll close there. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Mark Griffin. Maximum six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And as, as has already been said, we will be supporting the, the Procurement from Bill at decision time tonight because we do feel that public sector procurement can achieve much more than the positive effect of that individual contract. It's been said already repeatedly that we spend £10 billion pounds a year on procuring goods and services in Scotland and we need to see the full economic, environmental and social benefits 
that vast sum of money can bring. The, the procurement reform bill can and should have been used to ensure payment of the living wage and public contracts, to maximise community benefit from procurement, demonstrate the Scottish Government's commitment to meeting their climate change targets, condemn the use of exploitative zero-hours contracts, tax avoidance and blacklisting, promote equality and support contractors committed to achieving equality, encourage sustainable food procurement, support skills development with apprenticeships, support the third sector and support people with disabilities into employment. Those are the areas where we have sought to strengthen the legislation and we feel that the procurement reform bill could have been a much more ambitious piece of work if the amendments tabled by Labour members had been taken on board completely. We do, however, welcome the Scottish Government's support on Jackie Bailey's amendments on equality and Ken McIntosh's amendment on protecting trade union recognition and Sarah Boyack's on food procurement. We also note the Government amendments passed this afternoon on the living wage following the campaign and we have had we have had alongside trade unions and the poverty alliance and also the government amendment around supported workplaces while those amendments are an improvement and we still feel that the government could have gone further by accepting our own amendments the, the scottish government amendment particularly on on living wage um, only requires con contractors to include a general policy statement on the living wage and their procurement strategy, our amendment would have required the payment of the living wage to workers. The, the Scottish Government themselves recognise that their amendment does not require the payment of the living wage um, to workers, so I would ask simply what practical effect um, that will have. Well, certainly. Kevin Stewart. Do I have Mr Stewart's microphone? President officer, in all of the debates that there have been in this parliament round about the living wage and procurement, uh, the case of Rufert versus Niedersachsen has been mentioned. Um, there has been no practical way put forward by the Labour Party how we get over that. Uh, can Mr Griffin explain how we deal with the case law that exists and the current rules that there is in Europe? Mark Griffin. There was evidence submitted by Thompson solicitors to his own committee and I'm sure that Mr. Mc that uh, the member would actually wish the government to be as ambitious as they were on alco alcohol minimum unit pricing as, as they could be with the, the living wage and would have seen a much stronger bill for that and um, the, the take home pay packets of th thousands of people who are on public contracts boosted as a result of that. Another area where I think the, the bill could have been strengthened was around zero hours and I'd ask the question of the Cabinet Secretary and why the Government couldn't commit to introducing contract performance clauses um, which stipulated that successful bidders must not use zero hours contracts since contractors already have to demonstrate through KPIs how they are meeting the requirements of contract performance clauses. Could the Scottish Government not have used those KPIs to, to monitor um, zero hours contracts and uh, I think that would be helpful if yeah, the Cabinet Secretary would be able to, to clarify that. This, the, the procurement strategies and annual reports are, are another um, area where, where we've welcomed that development. Um, they cover community benefit requirements, um, that they should deliver value for money, um, timescales for payments, summary of procurement activity in the next two years. That's a lot of good information which should drive up best practice and, and help companies bidding for work. Um, what's still missing though is from those procurement strategies is that reference to supported business um, which I pushed in my own amendment and um, we spoke about um, the own gov government's own policy that every public authority should have at least one contract um, with a supported business and it seems strange that we have a procurement reform bill which does not set that commitment in legislation. Uh, we debated that issue earlier, um, but I think when 44 public authorities don't award a single contract to supported businesses, I think that, that we really should have Final a minute. stronger commitment. The Scottish Government have worked to ensure staff members who are, who are directly employed get the living wage. Um, local authorities have taken a lead too, um, and while we have seen some moves in the private sector recently, 
the private sector just hasn't kept pace um, with the public sector on the living wage um, as much as we would have liked in terms of what the Scottish Government has done and what local authorities have done in areas like Renfrewshire. This bill did give us that opportunity to force those private companies bidding for contracts to pay staff the living wage and see that transformational knock-on effect that I think it would have had in the private sector. I think for that reason alone, we'll look Daughter, back please, please. and say that that was a £10 billion opportunity missed. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Nicola Sturgeon to wind up the debate. Deputy First Minister, eight minutes until 6.15, please. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. And uh, if I can again thank everybody uh, who's contributed, uh, not just to the uh, process of this bill, but to the debate this afternoon. There's a few themes I'll just pick up on that have been uh, raised uh, during the course of the debate. The first is uh, the process the bill has gone through. I agree, agree entirely with Jim Eady. I think the bill has improved as it's gone through its parliamentary uh, progress. Uh, James Kelly did manage to say uh, both that the bill had barely changed during its progress due to Scottish Government resistance to change, uh, but also then said that the Scottish Government had been forced into making changes on the living wage due to pressure. The reality is that we have made changes where the case for change has been made, both in principle, in practice and in legal terms. So we've made very important changes on the living wage. The bill is stronger now in respect of the living wage. We've made changes on tax avoidance, on reporting requirements, on trade union recognition, on health and safety, just to uh, name a few of the areas where this bill has been strengthened. I think that is uh, a credit not just to the government, but to everybody who's been involved in the scrutiny of this piece of legislation. Second theme relates to the importance of this bill. And, you know, it's a point I made in my opening remarks, but it bears repetition, and many members speaking in this debate have made this point. We spend £10 billion uh, through the public sector every year. It is vital that we ensure that that spend delivers economic and social benefits. And that is what we have sought to do through this bill, and it's what we will continue to seek to do through the uh, regulations and guidance that will flow from it. Now, I know and I accept the reality that Labour needs to manufacture divisions with the SNP. In fact, opposing the SNP now seems to be Labour's only real purpose in life. Uh, but nevertheless, notwithstanding that, it's interesting that many of the so-called divisions during this bill have actually been about how we achieve change, not if we achieve uh, that change. We might not always have agreed, we might not always have felt able to agree because of legal constraints uh, with Labour on how to advance certain priorities, but nevertheless, we have sought at every turn to find the best way possible of achieving the same objectives. And the living wage is a case in point here. Um, unlike Alec Johnson, and with the greatest respect to him, I have no objection to using the Procurement Reform Bill to advance the objective of the living wage. On the contrary, I would have liked to have supported Labour's amendments. If I had felt that those amendments were legally competent, I would have put them in the bill at its introduction. I couldn't because of the legal uh, restrictions that I have already outlined and I won't rehearse today. I would simply say to Hugh Henry that the whole purpose of the guidance is to further support councils like Renfrewshire to do what they are doing. The restriction is not in encouraging and supporting councils, it's about making it a mandatory requirement through this legislation. So again, the objective is shared. How we do it is the point of division, and I hope we can all now unite uh, about uh, doing it in the way that this bill enables. I have to say, on occasion, it's been a bit amusing to hear Labour members, and Mark Griffin used this argument in his summing up, uh, about the minimum wage, uh, sorry, about minimum pricing, not about the minimum wage. Uh, the, the issues are different in my view, but I recall the debates on minimum pricing for alcohol where Labour opposed that legislation, with the honourable exception of Malcolm Chisholm, tooth and nail for the specific reason that they thought it breached European law. Uh, that it would risk challenge on European legal grounds. They demanded to see our legal advice and said that in all conscience we couldn't pass this legislation because there was a risk that it would breach European law. So it's just a bit rich now to hear them uh, make the arguments that they're making in relation to this. I hope now that 
all members will work with us in developing the guidance. The STEC, Unison, the Poverty Alliance, who I had a very productive meeting with last week, have agreed to do so. Tavish Scott made, I think, a very good point. There's a big job for Parliament now to do in scrutinising uh, the secondary legislation. Uh, the other theme I just want to touch on is this theme of striking a balance. There are tensions that run through this agenda, and I've always been clear about that. There are competing interests. The public authorities want value for money. They have to think about affordability. Bidders want simplicity and ease of access to contracts. Taxpayers want rightly value for money in its widest sense. Those different interests don't always align easily. We've done our best in this bill and we will continue to do our best to strike the right balance between them. I want specifically, because Gavin Brown raised some of these points, uh, to, to say a word about SMEs. I absolutely endorse uh, the desire to see SMEs get a bigger slice of the public procurement cake. Uh, I would, though, share just some figures. SMEs make up 37% of our economy. They currently get 46% of the £10 billion in public contracts. I would like that to be more. Section 9 does say that public authorities, when undertaking a regulated procurement, have to look at how they facilitate SME involvement. Uh, Gavin Brown is right that the guidance will be important, and I certainly give him an undertaking that will give serious consideration to that. Um, presiding officer, in conclusion, I think we've done a difficult job well. I think we have provided a framework for public procurement that allows us now to develop the guidance and the regulations that will give effect to the economic and social objectives that many people rightly want to see public procurement deliver. Um, I have said repeatedly, and I will repeat again in the last few seconds of the time available to me, that we are determined to ensure that the £10 billion of public sector spend on contracts is spent in a way uh, that delivers economic growth, that delivers uh, advantages and benefits for our businesses, that delivers social benefits, that does ensure that disreputable companies don't get their hands on public money, that we stamp uh, down on tax avoiding, on blacklisting, on the inappropriate use of zero-hour contracts, that we do everything we can to promote and further the living wage. I think these are the objectives that all of us can sign up to. Now that we've got this bill and the statute book, we can get on with the job of making sure it delivers on these objectives. So, uh, again, I will uh, simply end by thanking all members who've contributed to this process, encourage them to continue uh, to do so, uh, but in closing, ask the Parliament uh, to pass, uh, in a few seconds' time, the Procurement Reform Scotland Bill in order to make big improvements in this agenda. Thank you, Deputy First Minister. Um, members will wish to note that the members debate immediately after um, decision time is in the name of Bill Kidd, and it's on recovering health costs for asbestos-related conditions and diseases. Um, that debate um, will start immediately at 6.15 after uh, decision time, um, and we have um, only one decision um, for tonight um, as a result of today's business, and that is on the um, Procurement Reform Scotland Bill. <laughs> and we now come to decision time. There is one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion number 10005, in the name of Nicola Sturgeon, on the Procurement Reform Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to, and the Procurement Reform Scotland Bill is now passed. <laughs> At the decision time, we now move to members' business.